What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and today we have Joe Inslee. Is that is, am I, am I oh, pronouncing yeah. your last name right? You got it, Joe Inslee. We got Joe Inslee here. Uh, if you don't remember, Joe. Oh, hold on, I accidentally i had I had the stream up, so it, I I started talking to myself in my ear. Um, today, uh, you know, we got Joe Inslee. Joe Inslee is uh, the guy that I responded to earlier this week with the quote unquote master class. No, on the how to worst master class. The worst, the worst master class. That's right. On on uh, witnessing to atheists, uh, he right. had some uh, insight for other Christians out there if they're looking to witness to atheists, and so I just kind of gave my feedback on how well those uh, those pointers, I guess might work out uh for for at least somebody like me um didn't mean to represent it as like you know indicative of all atheists obviously but um uh joe uh emailed me and we started talking about you know doing a stream so that we could you know talk about our world views and everything like that so uh you know i really appreciated uh, you reaching out to me and setting this up not a lot of people like react that way uh, there are some people that get really i guess um uh, upset wh whenever I do a response video uh, to them. So I'm really glad that you reached out and I wasn't too much of a dick, you no. know, in the video. <laughs> we call that, we call that being insecure. So uh, I was oh, on it? like, I worked as a medic for five years. So as long as no one's dying, I'm kind of hard to offend. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Uh, well, um, uh, Joe, do you want to introduce yourself? Like, uh, you know, what do you, what, what do you do here on YouTube as far as, uh, what you're doing and where people can find you and stuff like that? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Joe Inslee and my channel name is the same as that. And I have a channel geared towards, uh, equipping Christians, answering answers from the Bible, look up commonly asked questions. And then I try to answer them. I also do theological stuff with song reviews and that sort of stuff. And obviously the video that you found was me, uh, telling Christians how to witness to someone such as yourself, uh, which was, I, I really actually appreciated how you tore it apart and you did a great job tearing it apart. And that's why I was like, well, yikes. I know I'm pretty easy to, he, he handled that really well. I'd like to see how he handles this in person. And, and I will say, first of all, like lots of your comments about, well, okay, this is a really crappy move. He's kind of being a jerk here. I was kind of like, yeah, if I heard me and I walked up to someone and I was like, I know what you believe better than you. That's a sucky way to start a conversation. Uh, so obviously mm -hmm. I come at it from a biblical perspective and I believe, you know, God's word has said that everyone believes this. So I'm coming at it from that worldview, but I would never start a conversation that way. But I was like, hey, I think this would be a really good conversation. And also, like I said in the email, I just envisioned you as the kind of guy that a scotch and some cigar and some conversations would be like superb with. So I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I mean, I don't really smoke, but uh, definitely like a, a scotch or a whiskey or something like that, I, I'm usually down for. Um, but so I wanted to give you the opportunity uh, right up front. Well, you suggested this, but I think it's a really good idea of, you know, you wanted some, you had some clarifying questions that you wanted to ask yeah. me, like about what I meant in the video and everything like that. So I figured I'd give you, you know, that chance to sort of uh, clarify some things. Yeah, sure. Um, so for clarifying a few things, uh, I think one of the things that caused me to even reach out and have the discussion was you said something, you said a lot of these apologists, uh, cannot imagine a world without God. Uh, and so trying to get them to overcome their own bias is impossible. And I thought, yeah, I think most apologists don't even consider that. And to be fair, most people are so entrenched in their own perspectives and worldviews and biases that that's how we all function. But I mean, for me, I was like, yeah, I can't imagine a world without God. And uh, that's kind of the reason I grew up. I think you said uh, in your bio, you're an ex-Christian. So I grew up Christian. I tried to be an ex-Christian for a while and I felt like the Lord pulled me back. Uh, but I think the two things that for me, like, especially if I'm trying to imagine my world without a God, the two things that don't make sense to me that have always brought me back are like, what is my purpose? If there is no God, what is my purpose? And I know in a couple other videos you talk about that, but I'd love to hear what is the purpose of a world uh, without God? And then also like, where does our morality come from? And that's always been one of the big arguments that brings back to me. It's like, God is the standard of morality. We see it pop up everywhere. We all, there's actually a pretty generalized collective consensus on a general level. You know, like 
Most people think killing people is wrong. Uh, you know, stuff like that. So where's our morality coming from if there is no God? So, yeah, I figure let's start there because those are the two hardest parts for me to imagine happening without a God. Well, uh, so, uh, you know, I want to I want so I want to tackle both of these things, you know, individually, obviously. Um, and, but but I, I do have to ask, like, do you think that you can make a coherent argument from the Bible that killing is wrong? Because uh, I, I find it hard to understand how uh, a, a Christian uh, who fully believes in the inerrance, is, I, well, I don't know if you're an inerrantist, uh, but who, who, who believes in, in the whole Bible to, uh, I don't understand how somebody can say it's, it's objectively wrong to kill a person. If, if you're going with the Bible. So maybe we could touch on that here in a little bit. Yeah. Um, oh, I'd but, love to talk uh, about that, yeah. Yeah, okay. So as far as purpose goes, here's 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 how my mind works uh, with that particular question. And and, and I have to go back to, well, what, what is the purpose of, of anything in, in either nature or this universe or anything like that? Like, is there any purpose? And what i what i find is that that n- nature just sort of operates like there there's no purpose necessarily as far as we understand it like there there's no purpose to this universe like then you have to ask yourself like what's the purpose of 99.999% of this universe or this uh yeah this universe being uninhabitable like what what's the purpose of these planets that have no effect on us whatsoever uh, like outside of the Milky Way galaxy or outside of our own solar system, what purpose do they have, right? Do, do they really have a purpose? Or are they there for some kind of transcendental reason? Um, and I, I can't, uh, I, I mean, I can't fathom like a reason why they're there. And I feel like if, if, if I can't figure out like a purpose for why those things are there, then it kind of seems like, um, the, the best uh, assumption to make uh, at that point, uh, given the evidence, is that there just is no purpose. But th- uh, that's not to say that I think that my my life is purposeless. I, I just feel like I give my own life purpose. Like I I find things in my life uh, to to be purposeful. Like I'm a father. Uh, my my son is uh, 12, about to be 13. Uh, this coming January. Uh, and, you know, I, I find <clears throat> my role as a father to him to be very purposeful. I get a lot of purpose from that. I, I, I pull purpose from a lot of different things. Like here on YouTube, as far as being an atheist activist, I feel like uh, I have a lot of purpose there in, um, you know, providing uh, fellow atheists with good arguments against um religious arguments uh you know if if there's somebody out there that's doubting and and is and is wondering well why aren't these people convinced of this argument and you know they could stumble upon my video um and and find it and and here are the reasons why i'm not convinced by these things and and maybe that that um you know appeals to them on some kind of level like oh that makes total sense or it could help them in the complete opposite direction of like oh that doesn't make any kind of sense this guy's an idiot you know i I get both of those kind of reactions and so i I feel like i find multiple bits of purpose in my life in varying degrees and in varying uh topics uh or, or various um maybe not top topics is a bad word, but various subjects or various in various ways. Do I find purpose in my life, uh, purpose and meaning. And so it's instead of, I, I feel like maybe you can correct me on this, but I feel like in a Christian worldview, the purpose of life is to praise God. And, you know, there's various ways, obviously that, that Christians feel like they praise God. They praise God by, uh, you, you know, just adhering to to the rules set forth in the Bible, uh, uh, or or the you know some Christians sort of, in my experience, they just sort of make up you know what the, this def- this subjective definition of what it means to be good, and by being good, you're praising God and all these other things, and so 
but what it ultimately comes back to is the purpose in a Christian worldview is to ultimately uh, praise God. And it's just always struck me as odd because like it, 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 Christians think that atheists don't have any kind of purpose, have no sense of meaning or purpose in their life because our meaning and purpose isn't praising God. And uh, I just find that you can have purpose and meaning outside of like the whole God idea. Well, um, yeah, I would go with, obviously you're, you're kind of nailing the definition. I would say that we find objective rule. We would call them objective rules in scripture that we would follow to praise God. But Westminster catechism is going to say this chief in a man to enjoy God and glorify him forever. So, or glorify God and enjoy him forever. So that, that would be the purpose. But I mean, for me, so, uh, in this scenario, the way you would put that out, I would say that in that scenario, you wouldn't say there's no God, but you are your God. You define your own purpose. So like I keep. Well, uh, but, but but sorry to interrupt, but, yeah, but sure. I, I do. Uh, but I do have to stop. I don't consider myself God. OK, uh, uh, be, because the and, uh, the way that I see God is this supernatural, you know, divine figure that exists outside of. Of, of our universe that's outside of our reality that controls things. And ju just because I, I can determine what my own purpose is and, and I find my own purpose without the need for an outside observer to give me that purpose, just because I find my own purpose does not mean that I am God. So I just want to, I want to be very clear sure. that, you know, I don't consider myself God. And I think that characterizing atheists as considering themselves to be God um, is, is not an accurate way to describe it. Okay. Well, I think when it comes down to figuring out your purpose, so I, I keep tarantulas, love them and they're great. But so let's see, I have a tarantula here and he's in his cage and he's decided the only thing that matters to him are his little stick and his water dish and the things in his cage. And there's a piano in this room. And he looks at that piano and he thinks there's no need for that piano. Why is that piano even here? It doesn't even matter. Uh, and he doesn't know my purpose for that piano and it doesn't affect him. So maybe he decides that only the things in his enclosure give him purpose. But in that scenario, uh, we would both say it would be stupid to allow a tarantula to decide what has purpose and what doesn't. And so in that way, I would say that I do believe there's a God and he might have purposes for things and I'm okay not knowing what they are and I'm okay not understanding them because in this situation, I'm the tarantula. Like I don't decide uh, what the potter and the has decided for the clay. So I would say that to have that purpose out there, you can decide that there's only purpose in the things you make them. And I certainly appreciate that. And all the things you're saying you find purpose in, I would find similar similarities with you on that. But I would say that doesn't mean that there's not purpose for the other things. You just might not know what they are. Well, my, the, the, that there's not, because I, I kind of feel like with your analogy here with the tarantula is that like, I somehow am trying to dictate what is meaningful or purposeful to somebody else. No, and I mean, like, just for you. I know you're doing it for you, not for everybody, for sure. Okay, well, because I, I just, um, I'm wondering if you could reflect on your analogy a little bit here, because it's like nobody would allow the tarantula to make decisions on what is or isn't purposeful to other people, just because it's not purposeful, uh, you know, for 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 the tarantula. But that's not. That's not what I'm trying to do at all. I'm not trying to say, oh, Joe can't have his piano because I can't play piano, so it has no purpose. Like that that's not I'm what not, I'm trying to do. I'm going to. a different route. I would say that the tarantula is wrong. And the tarantula might not be deciding for all the other tarantulas, but whether the tarantula understands the uh, uh, reason for a piano or not, the tarantula is still wrong. Uh, and the tarantula may not understand it. So in that illustration, well, you might not see a purpose for the things, but that doesn't mean that there is no purpose for them or that God hasn't created them to glorify himself. We just don't understand it. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, I get where you're coming from on this, but like it, it's, it's, uh, I kind of feel like you're trying to say, well, those, those things still have a purpose, uh, you know, outside of the tarantula, it, but but that that's not, like I'm not trying to say that there aren't like I don't know it's it's kind of I guess it's kind of hard to translate that to like what I'm trying to say with my purpose because I'm not trying to say that other things don't have purpose in this world right like I'm not trying to say any of that but also from the perspective of the tarantula there is no purpose for a piano 
to exist. Sure. Like it does, it doesn't care about the piano. Right. And so like, um, you know, the only thing that I'm advocating here is just that just because I don't have some outside force to dictate a, a, a singular purpose in life, that doesn't mean that I don't have purpose. Just like, you know, just because the piano has a purpose for you, that doesn't mean that, you know, the, uh, in the tarantula's uh, view of the world, you know, the, um, his stick in, in the wa uh, uh, watering bowl or, or whatever um, that's in his, uh, that's in his enclosure. Um, that doesn't mean that those things don't have purpose to it. You know, like, I, I, I don't know. It, I've, I've never been that great at this kind of in-depth philosophy or philosophical sort of um, uh, uh, explanation. Uh, but I just, I see these things as, as two different things. Like, I don't see the tarantula as saying, well, the piano has no purpose. <clears throat> like in general, I see that the tarantula is like, oh, I have no purpose for the piano. So I don't care about the piano. All he cares about are those things that you listed. And those things are, are, I guess, purposeful to him in his life. And that's what he's concerned with. He doesn't have to be concerned with the piano if somebody else has a purpose in the piano, fine, whatever. But the tarantula is just concerned about the things that are purposeful to him. So, uh, yeah, so I, I want to keep uh, probing on this and I want to hear, I uh, respect you too much to insult your intelligence. So I'm just going to be upfront about which argument I would take this down to Pascal's wager. So which uh -huh. tarantula is wiser? The one that assumes there's a purpose and something more powerful or the one that says there is no purpose and I don't need to care about it. And obviously uh, for those watching that might not know, Pascal's wager is uh, if there is an eternity of uh, torment, then the safest bet for me is to bet on doing what I need to do to not go there. And if there is, if there isn't an eternal torment and I don't ever make a decision to deal with it, I lose nothing when I die. The guy that has more at stake is the one who believes it doesn't exist and it really does exist. That's the guy with more at stake. So the smart wager in Pascal's mind would be uh, bet that there is eternal torment and destruction and do what you can to avoid it in this life. So uh, piano, tarantula, but purpose, no purpose, trying to figure out whether things have purpose to us or not. How would you deal with Pascal's wager with that? Well, I mean, I can't, I, I, I can't really... I don't really understand the whole tarantula analogy when concerned with uh, Pascal's wager. So maybe is it okay if I just directly interact with the Pascal's? Yeah, wager just let's argument? go straight to Pascal's. That works for me. Okay. Uh, so the problem that I have with Pascal's wager is that it assumes that the decision is between atheism and Christianity. Okay. So what are the and, other options? Well, there's Islam, there's Buddhism, okay. there's there's several other different paths to, you know, whatever happens after this life or or how to live your life. So, it's sure. not if you were to do a true dichotomy between it, it's it's between atheism and theism, right? So you've got like a 50-50 split like and then sure. your yeah. your argument is is that it's even uh, atheism has 50%, theism has 50%, but then your particular definition of Christianity is this small sliver of a percentage. And okay. so that, that small sliver of a, of a percentage is you're going to die and burn in hell unless you're this kind of Christian. But then you're talking about like, that there's this uber specific definition of, of a Christian that gets to go to heaven and then all the other ones that don't do the things that prevent them from going to hell. Uh, and as far as this little sliver of Christianity goes, they also go to hell. So it's not really like if you, if you could even just uh, broaden this a little bit, it, it's how do you make a decision between atheism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity? Well, like, if you put the, all of those on the table, even if you have mm -hmm. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever, is it? I mean, I would still see atheism as the, you know, worst choice according. I mean, you've got a better bet with any of the other options than you do with atheism in Pascal. Do you? Because uh, because if if I if I'm an atheist and and there there is an afterlife, 
you know, after this one, we, we have no idea what that afterlife is. So <clears throat> you could be just as wrong as I am. Um, and so th then it seems like if um, it, it seems like the if, if the entire purpose of the argument is to do everything that you can to prevent yourself from going to hell. Right. Then it, it, it makes no sense to me why you'd have to just basically roll a, 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 a you know, a die uh, like a D 20 and, you know, pick, pick a number and just pick a religion. Uh, Cause I mean uh, like Judaism, um, Judaism, Islam, Christianity. I mean, while they're all Abrahamic religions, like you can't adhere to Islam and Christianity at the same right. time. And so Judaism you're saying at the there's same time. too many choices to make a safe bet. I, I, I think that uh, any any one bet is a total crapshoot because we don't know. Either. Yeah. So I don't see – I guess what I'm getting at is that there's no compelling reason for me to pick one religion or uh, over no religion. Um, well, let me go back to um, – that, that's a great answer. I appreciate that. Let me go back to your question of how do we know which one of those we would pick. Uh, for me, that comes down to one question. What do you do with Jesus? And so you're looking at this guy who we know existed, who did stuff, who said stuff. We've got it down. And I know a lot of people like might disagree about what he did or how he did it. But historically, I mean, our calendars are marked by the guy. He lived on Earth. Something happened. Well, yeah. So, but uh, So do you know why our calendars are marked by his birth? Well, before we get there, it's not, dude, there's no intelligent historian that denies the historicity of Jesus. We all know the guy exists. I'm going to need a citation for that. Because uh, okay. it's not it's not that there's no there's there's no historian that doubts it, the historicity of Jesus. It's that there's there's no mainstream New Testament scholar that doubts the historicity of Jesus. And and so there's there, actually about so are 20, there secular well, historians that don't believe in Jesus that they don't believe he ever yes. existed? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'll say they they either don't think he existed or the doubts. Uh, or at least is favorable to doubting his existence. There's at least 27 scholars who have degrees in relevant fields that that at least say that doubting the historicity of Jesus is a is a viable like thing to do. So I mean, there's there's plenty of them out there, and I, I just I I. W I always caution people to say that it's not that mainstream historians think this it's that new Testament scholars think this. And there's, there's a bit of a difference there. I know that new Testament scholars, they do dabble in history a little bit, but new Testament scholarship is really tangential to history that they're not trained as historians, but yet they speak on historical matters. So, I mean, I, I don't mean for this to become the entire Sure, conversation sure. obviously but uh, i am a mythicist so like i don't okay. think that jesus existed as a historical person okay. i think that he was always thought of as purely celestial okay. uh, 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 even by paul is the earliest but I, for the purposes of this conversation and and the conversation of pascal's wager i'm totally fine with just the assumption that jesus existed well let me just um, answer the question of how i would pick christianity over the other ones why i believe okay. that's a safer bet so okay, and i mean my first college i went to was completely secular and that's where i took my first history classes in college and they thought of jesus they, they wouldn't agree with how the Bible defines Jesus, how I would see it, but they all seem to agree that he existed. He was a great teacher to them amongst Mohammed and the other guys. Um, and so I would say that when we're dealing with Jesus, uh, I would look at who deals with Jesus the best way. And so Jesus says some controversial things such as I'm the way, the truth and the life. And so then you go into that. Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic or is he for real? We need to find out the evidence. And I would say Christianity, Judeo Christianity deals with, what happened with the life of Jesus better than the other religions, which is why I would see it as the safe bet. Now you might not see that as safe bet, but to explain why I would pick this one tiny sliver and say it's the safest bet, that's why I would go with it. Well, yeah, but I mean, there were plenty of, of um, apocalyptic Jewish rabbis that were running around the first century uh, claiming the exact same things uh, about it. The, the whole, the way the truth and the life thing, we can't actually pin that to, uh, Jesus actually saying it, uh, th that was actually, it, it, I believe that comes from the Gospels. I don't think that that's in Paul. Am I right about that? Yeah, just the book of John is where we see that. But, yeah, book of John. Well, see, the book of John is uh, most definitely a second century gospel document. 
And so it it actually uh, r- redacts and changes like the previous gospels that were written. So I mean that that one I would consider to be too late. Out of all the gospels, I would say that Mark is probably the most historical one. Although there's no real good methodology to separate out the historical information from fictional information, as far as Jesus is concerned in the Gospel of Mark. So um, you know I I don't I. No, no, none of the information that's contained in the Gospels it, it can be considered historical information because of the fact that we can't separate out uh, fiction from from uh, history uh, in them. And so, what what uh, for me personally, I feel like you kind of have to go on um, uh, Paul's writings that are about Jesus. So, uh, if you're asking like who who handles this Jesus person better? Um, I, I feel like that's kind of cherry picking your your people in history. Like, why are you focusing on this particular uh, Jesus? Uh, the, well, the guy, also the guy that uh, rises from the dead has more weight to me than the dudes that are still in the grave for me. And we're not going to agree on this. And I realize that. And I right. know that you don't see that as an argument. I'm saying that's why I would pick this sliver. Well, yeah, but do you understand that um, there, there, there are – like like um let's go between christianity and islam uh islam affirms that jesus existed says that he was a prophet and all this other stuff uh but you know that they they have this extra you know testament i guess or these extra writings from muhammad uh who was inspired by an angel to write all this stuff down like apparently he was uh, illiterate or he, he couldn't write or something like that. So, something, something like that, yeah. some uh, to degree. So, and, and, and this is happening 500 year, uh, six, 600 years after Jesus, uh, supposedly died. And I mean, that particular book says that, well, you know, he didn't actually rise from the dead. Um, so, I mean, it, it just kind of seems a bit cherry picking to me because okay, like, but, but technically to be consistent, you cherry pick it too. I've watched a good yeah. bit on your channel and you spend a lot more time going against the Christian Jesus than you deal with Mohammed. And both of these people would be considered theists and you're an atheist, which means you shouldn't agree with either one of us, but you spend a lot more time on the Jesus than you do the Mohammed. So technically well, yeah, we're both sort of cherry picking when it comes to that. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not cherry picking because I criticize uh, both religions. Uh, maybe not. I, I maybe don't spend as much time on on the topic of Islam than I do on the topic of Christianity. But that's because I'm in North Alabama. Uh, you know, like uh, cr- Christianity is is what I'm faced with most of the time. What when when I interact either online or, or anywhere. But I have no no problems with you know uh, responding or disagreeing with. Uh, Islam. So, I mean, I'm not really cherry picking because I'm not, I'm not saying, Oh, well, Islam's better than Christianity. I was merely pointing out that like, there's these two different religions and you seem to just be focusing on the one that you kind of grew up in or the one that you've been exposed to the most. And you're saying, well, that one is more likely to be true than this one, but not really giving a reason as to why this one is, is a false religion. Well, Yours is the one true religion. Well, I'll be honest with you. You're the first uh, atheist I've discussed with or seen in a debate that uh, believes that there is plausible deniability for the life of Jesus. Most of the people I've run across are very cool with saying, yeah, the guy existed. We're pretty cool with that. Um, And so for me, I, I would go with the mainstream and say, yeah, Jesus existed. And then I look for who deals with him and what he did the best. Um, And then obviously, I mean, for me, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take this and turn it into a he said, she said business. Um, well, actually, he said, he said, my bad. But also for me, it's personal experience. So like, I, I mean, I right. know who I was before I turned to Christ. I know who I was after. And so for me, there's also a personal experience element in there. And so I'm looking for uh, a, a, a system that helps me understand uh, what has happened in my life and, and who this figure is. And I find Christianity the best answer. And it's okay if you don't, but that's that's where I would be on it. Yeah, but do you do you see how it's kind of inherently subjective there? Uh, because like, well, we're y- both you, in faith based systems. I mean, the atheists have a faith based system. The Christianity no. has a faith based system. I, I, so can you can you explain that a little bit? Because I don't see myself as as having faith. Like I don't 
I, I don't I don't have faith in in anything as far as the same way uh, that religious faith operates. Like I just I, I don't have I, I'm not part of a faith system just because I don't believe in a God. Well, OK, so um, I can't even remember the guy's name. This is terrible. It's how well you did indoctrinating me on your channel. Uh, the vampire <laughs> guy who spoke at Prager U. Uh, you called him the vampire. The oh, whole time. Uh, st uh, Stephen. Um, yes. Oh, crap. Stephen yeah. somebody. Yeah. Stephen yeah, Vampire. Yeah. Um, and so you spent your time dealing with Mr. Vampire. One of the things you said is, so one of his arguments was about, um, and we, we need to come back to Paley's Watchmaker because you completely dismissed it in my other video. And I think it's a valid argument. So I want to come back to Paley's Watchmaker. But he essentially went the same direction. He's like, we see the design that points to a designer. And you said that, and I, I'm going to be really close and correct me if I'm wrong. You said, basically, we're just, uh, we have patterns in our brain and we are, um, Oh, biological, like we've evolved to see patterns and we see a pattern of design and that that helped us survive through evolution, but now it's hurting us in the modern world. And so uh, you would, you would look at something that I would say, this is designed and you would say it looks designed, but it's not. And so to me, I have to have a lot of faith to say this looks designed, but I've been told it's not designed. That takes an act of faith for me. Um, so that's why I'd say we're both okay. in faith-based systems here. Uh, okay. Well, so what, I, I don't have faith that like, let's just choose a flower because that's that's usually what people go to. But it's it's easy to picture it in your head. I, I don't have faith that a flower isn't designed. I, I and I and I get how people perceive it to be designed, uh, the way that the flower looks, how it operates, and all this other stuff. But you see, the thing is, is that we have natural uh, processes that explain why a flower. Uh, forms the way that it does like there's there's diff there's different reasons for the coloring on it there's there's different reasons for why like uh chloroform not chloroform sorry um chlorophyll uh chlorophyll formed uh in order to uh you know generate glucose uh out of sunlight or produce uh glucose out of sun uh from the sunlight and all this other stuff like we have natural explanations for how those mechanisms and those things like uh, uh developed over time and so it's not that i have faith that something that looks designed but isn't designed i don't have faith that it isn't designed i know that it's not designed because i understand that natural processes don't require a god as far as we understand it right now but that's like saying that because gas and combustion makes an engine run and we can understand that the fuel pump takes the gas to the engine it combusts. That's like saying because I can explain that there's no need for a mechanic to put the fuel pump in the car. And we both know that, yeah, that design, that that process does not happen by itself. If someone had to design it. And so why is it wrong for me to assume when I see a car, there was a mechanic than for me to look at a flower and realize there's a flower maker somewhere. Why is well, that? Because uh, well, well, because we we know that uh, cars are designed and built by humans. Like those well, humans are the intelligent designers of cars. We we know that that's the case. And when it comes to flowers and natural processes, we don't have evidence that there is some entity out there that is required for natural processes to happen. And until we can bridge that, the existence of the designed object is the proof required for a designer like the existence well, of no no, no i mean so like so I got mechanic right well, well well so like for the car we don't have any natural processes that explain how a car just naturally comes into existence but we do have natural processes for how flowers grow and form and how organisms evolve over time so i mean we have natural well, explanations for those things we don't have a similar natural explanation other than you know in uh, uh humans intelligently designing a car and putting it together like we don't have like there's no way that you can plant something in the ground and grow a ferrari right but you but the, a, a seed you can plant in the ground and due to you know the, the the different biological processes that that it goes through to grow a flower um so i mean th th those are two different things right there 
I'm not, I'm not understanding how they're different because I would say the more complex the system, the more obvious the need for a designer. And yeah, like I said, we understand how fuel makes the engine combust. But then we also know that someone had to put all that stuff together. And I would say the more complex the system, the more obviously we have a need for a designer. And so when I look at a human body and I look at a blood pressure system and the heartbeat and all that, and, and, I, and I see this, that tells me, well, somebody had to design it. And sure, maybe I can observe the natural process at work. I can see it happening. That's like me seeing a car go down the road and be like, don't worry, kids. We know that the fuel goes from the fuel pump to the engine. That's how it goes. It didn't need a mechanic. Just because we can observe the natural process happening doesn't mean that someone didn't design the natural process that's taking place in front of us. Well, but but we don't have evidence that somebody did design the natural process. See, that's that's the key for me there is that we don't have any evidence that suggests that we need a designer for the natural process the natural process is just there. And until you can prove the need for a designer or until you can prove the need for some intelligent source to make that process work for, for me, there's just no need for that explanation. So what are the criteria to know if someone's something's designed or not? I mean, that's, that's, that's the ultimate question for the teleological argument, right? What, how do you how do you differentiate design? Yeah, but I'm not objects? asking William Lane Craig. I'm asking you. Like, what are your no, no, no. criteria I, I as an atheist to know something's designed? Well, oh, I, I mean, I I understand that. I'm I'm just trying to contextualize it in the in in the sure. you know topic of of the teleological argument. Um, and, and I feel like that's the crux of of it because I feel like in the teleological argument, everything's designed. Right. Just it's kind of scattershot. Everything's designed. So everything needs a designer. Whereas in a more natural perspective, the the objects that are are designed like as in these things are not naturally occurring, like as far as we experience it, like uh, 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 examples of that would be like cars, planes, bridges, as far as bridges as as we know them to be designed you know sure, sure. um but but uh the undesigned what i would call undesigned objects are uh objects or or things that come into existence through natural processes and so if if there's a natural pro like a mountain a mountain is not designed um uh, flat i don't consider flowers to be designed because uh, you know, there's a natural process for how organisms change. That would be evolution. And then there's natural processes that explain how a seed, how you can go from a seed to a plant. Um, I mean, there's natural processes for all of that. Those natural processes happen regardless of whether or not there's some intelligent source around as far as we, as, as far as we can detect natural processes operate without the need for an intelligence. But how so, do you define what are your defining characteristics for what is designed and what isn't designed? How do you tell those things apart? Well, I mean, like, like I said, it's it's whether or not you have natural processes to explain the object that you're looking to ex to explain. Um, and, and by natural processes, what I'm talking about here are processes that occur uh, without the need for an intelligent uh, an intelligent beings interference. So like, um, uh, uh, like, uh, mountains or, or caves, uh, nat natural caves, obviously not man-made caves or anything like that, but like caves or, uh, other natural formations. Um, I, I, I guess you could say uh, like a good, a good example using the mountains idea is like Mount Rushmore, right? Okay. Now, obviously, I would identify that as something that's been intelligently designed and carved, uh, sure. but, but that's that's primarily because you know th this is something that is from our history. This is something that uh, and an, an, uh, a human being would know about that that's uh, appeared on the side of a rock, but does that translate to just a regular mountain? Just a regular mountain sitting there. Well, no, because we have plate tectonics that explain how mountains grow. We've got wind and water erosion that explain the shape of a mountain. So just like a, a natural mountain that just exists out there is is different than a mountain that's been carved by humans. Because we can we can identify, you know, the shape that's carved in on the side of it and 
it's it's very obviously something that's been carved by a human that's uh, you know at, at least um lived at the time or something like that it's very obvious it's a very obvious carving that somebody has done versus just a regular plain old mountain that has natural processes to explain it like we don't we don't have a natural process necessarily to explain why perfectly chiseled heads appeared on the side of a mountain like right. the natural explanation for that is an intelligent being a human carved it into that but like if we have a mountain that that sort of looks like it has a face on it. Like it could, like we recognize right. that to kind of be sort of like a face. I mean, you can explain that through pareidolia, wind erosion, water erosion, and plate tectonics. Like the though, problem with that is, is it's only working if you can recognize the elements of design you need, which means you can look at it and you can say, I know a human card, the face is a Mount Rushmore. However, if there is a being whose design processes you don't recognize because they're not like a human and they are being designed, then you're just seeing a natural process and attributing it to a natural process with oh. forgetting a designer. Like if my tarantula thinks his stick has always been in his cage and he says, well, the stick's always been here because the stick is here. He's forgetting that someone set up the cage before he got there and put the stick in it. And it could be the same with the mountains. Just because you don't recognize a human level of design doesn't mean there wasn't another kind of designer that's above humans creating that, that, you don't recognize because it's not the way humans would design Rushmore. Well, now, now I, I, I do have to agree with you on this, uh, but um, it, it's just because my, my position has always been that we don't have any evidence that says a designer or an intelligent being is needed for natural processes. And so if you can prove that link that a, an intelligent being is required for natural processes to happen, then you would have a good argument for saying that, well, even naturally uh, uh, occurring objects are, are designed because you get this intelligent being that set up these processes and this is the outcome of those processes. But the problem is, is that you don't have that link. Like there's nothing that says that an intelligent being is required for natural processes to happen. As far as we can tell and detect uh, there's, there's no intelligence behind you know, natural processes. And so for me, the way that I go about it, the way, the, the, the way that I see it is, is that unless you can prove that that is necessary, then there's no reason to believe that it's there. Now it's not that I'm ruling out the possibility. I'm, I'm totally open to the possibility of it. I just don't see the evidence that it's required. And therefore I don't believe it to be true currently. Well, and we don't have to spend all our time here on teleological argument, but that would be where we'd be an impasse because anything that I would mm -hmm. see as evidence is going to be, you're going to reject that as evidence. And so that's not going to work because I'm going to say, well, I've got evidence. I think the Bible's going to provide me some evidence. I'm going to say the existence of these things is evidence itself. And you're going to say, no, I don't believe that is. So that's where we're going to get stuck at an impasse there because we're going to have different sources of evidence. And then we got to figure out where we're deciding what is true. And, um, yeah, so that's a whole nother discussion. Right, right. I, and I know, yeah, so the second part that you had brought up was, is, is uh, morality. Oh, yeah. And yeah I, I, know, I, I, know, I know we're kind of, we're, we're about 15 minutes out from an hour. I got you know, time, bro. This is great. Let's keep rolling. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, as far as the, the moral laws or, or morality in general goes, um, as, as far as my my personal worldview on it is is that it's you know subjective and relative. Uh, I feel like uh, human societies have always, um, you know, changed changed what the social norms are, and those social norms uh, therefore uh, uh, in inform like what 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 are more what the morals of that society is like the the very general basic moral foundation of that society is and i think that we're at a point in in human history where successful large societies have what we perceive as this common moral foundation um but just because we've all agreed well this is the best way for you know large groups of people to survive and thrive and, and these very basic ideas are, are what allow us to live and grow. <coughs> um, uh, that does not then translate into some kind of transcendental, uh, absolute, 
moral law that's contained in the Bible. The only problem with that is the first time you see the rules that we pretty much agree with today and very similar set of rules. The first time you see that level of morality being expressed to a large group of people uh, happens with Moses and the Ten Commandments. That's the first time we mm. see these things introduced. I don't, well, no, uh, it's it's actually not because uh, prior prior to the um, Pentateuch or, or or you know the the um, uh, the Moses and all that as far as uh, when we understand Moses to have been uh, walking around, which I I don't think that Moses uh, ever walked the earth. I, I think I that, that Moses is is a made up person. Um, uh, but but the general time frame in which that popped up for the Israelites. Uh, there was actually the Code of Hammurabi that existed prior to that uh, that espoused uh, some of the same general ideas like don't steal, don't murder, all this other stuff. Uh, so, I mean, you had civilizations prior to the Israelites that uh, that had similar law codes, uh, even more extensive law codes than the Israelites had. Uh, so, so they they definitely definitely wasn't like something that was new. Uh, to the Israelites, they were definitely co-opting surrounding ideas and, and just writing it down in their particular holy books. Okay, well, obviously we could go down the road where I argue that the existence of morality points to someone that gave us the morality, and you're well, not going to go with me on that. Let's switch gears and go back. Oh, you got something? Well, well yeah, I mean, I was just going to ask really quick that because even, even in... Uh, you know, Judaism then and, and Judaism turning into Christianity throughout that long history that uh, the Abrahamic religions have, you have a very fluid moral foundation. Wouldn't you agree? No, I thought the Ten Commandments were pretty serious, like pretty, pretty solid. Now, people disobeyed them all the time, but I think the actual law that God gave was pretty clear and explicit and not super fluid. Well, I, I feel like you're cherry picking a little bit as far as the the laws go, because a part part of the the laws of Israel was slavery. So I mean, like they they instantiated laws. They they had uh, a lot of laws concerning who you can take as slaves. At what point is it okay to? Uh, you know, take a debtor and turn them into a slave. Um, uh, you know, they had very specific laws about slavery in, in the Israelite culture, which uh, uh, to, to um, their credit, um, it, it, these laws were very similar to the laws of the surrounding ancient Near East cultures. Uh, true, but that, that just seems to be that the Israelites were co-opting already existing slavery laws and then having God establish them in their book so i mean it's just a very propagandish way of establishing these slavery laws but if god is the same now uh, as he was in the past and as he will be in the future then uh it seems to me like god's perfectly fine with slavery but yet now the moral standard as far as christianity goes here in america is that slavery is bad it's it's obscene it's abhorrent it's not good so it, it like that's just the, and and that's just one facet of the quote unquote moral foundation provided by the Bible is not absolute. Like that's part of it. I, that's just, been I wouldn't describe it as fluid, though. I wouldn't describe it as fluid, and I don't know uh, why we get the right to go back to people who say we got the law from God and to say no, you didn't get it from God because it didn't exist. When they're like, yeah, we got it from God. He told us, and that's what we dealt with. Like I mean. Neither one of us were there. So, but, but I, before we go down this road, and if we want to come back to this road, we can come back to this road. I actually want to deal with something like way more awesomely controversial that you said when you reviewed my video. And that is godless. And, and for, for the record, <laughs> um, lots of respect for a guy who knows an incredibly lot about a book uh, and has dedicated a lot of time and energy to something he doesn't believe exists. I wouldn't have the energy to handle things that I didn't believe it exists like you. So lots of respect for you're very knowledgeable about where I'm coming from. You have a really good understanding of my arguments and stuff. So props for that. But you claimed that godless engineer is morally superior to God. And I would love to hear right. how you make that work. Uh, yeah. So I thought that was a great statement. I'd love to touch on that with you for a minute. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I could just point out one chapter in the Old Testament that sure. proves it. Numbers 31. Numbers 31. 
Yeah. Uh, right, specifically, so what are we looking at for number thirty-one? Uh, well, uh, it, it's it's specifically located in verses seventeen and eighteen. Uh, okay. Basically, what happens is that is that God commands Moses to go into the Midianite culture and and kill everybody. Vengeance uh, inclu- on Midian is the name of the chapter. So yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. <laughs> so so they they go into the Midianites. They kill everybody. All all the men, all the warring men, all the men that would be fighting back, but also the women, and all of the small boys. And then they captured the prepubescent girls who haven't known the touch of a man. Uh, to be used in sexual slavery. Okay. And considering that God has, has commanded Moses to do this, uh, not just here, but in other places as well. This is just one of the most explicit references that I, I have off the top of my head. Um, but considering that God has commanded them to do these things, and there is no path in my life whatsoever <clears throat> where I could imagine myself uh, I'm you know, amassing a group and individuals, let's say, let's say I had everybody that subscribed to my channel and they all followed what I said and what I did as if it were God's word. I would never command them to go to another city and just utterly destroy everything in the city, men, women, children, babies, everything. And, and, and only take the, the, the girls, uh, the virgin girls to be sexual slaves. That there's no way that I would ever do that, and that in a, in and of itself makes me morally superior than God. Well, before I, first of all, I'm not going to concede that they were bringing in all the girls as sexual slaves. I believe they were bringing them in for something else. But the killing of everyone, I will concede that because that is exactly what Numbers 31 says. And I would wonder why that makes you morally superior if it's literally just survival of the fittest. Because if you go out there and you it's, slaughter and that, all the people, you're the strong one. You survive. Hooray, hooray for you. What, so uh, the first thing I have to ask is, how do you understand the survival of the fittest as far as an evolutionary like definition or an ev- evolutionary understanding would go? I'd go with the standard definition. The strong things survive by preying on the weak things, and whatever has the strength to survive survives, and then those genes replicate. And so as we go, technically, we should be getting better and better as the strong things survive. But, I mean, if you that's, are that's strong- not that That's not what survival of the fittest is. Uh, it means what is your all. definition, sir? Well, it's not that it's my definition. It's the scientific definition or the scientific understanding of the survival of the physics. And that's that organisms that are better adapted to survive in a particular environment will survive in an environment to uh, procreate. And so, it, you know, if, if an organism is moves into a new environment and their, or their population of organisms can adapt to that environment faster than or other organisms, then they will survive in that environment. That's what the survival of the fittest means. It's not about being the strongest or the most ruthless or uh, the, the, the least moral or anything like that. It's, uh, it, it's, it's simply who's better adapted to live and may, and, and, you know, that's a means of explaining why certain organisms survive. It's not like a prescription for survival. Okay. Like it's, it's a way to understand why an organism survives in the environment. You say this is descriptive, not a prescriptive process. I understand. Right. Okay. So I got to ask this. I want to come back because I'd like to take us to another chapter with the morality deal. But um, why is it, why would it be wrong for you to kill all those people? What what makes uh, – so your moral code is coming from somewhere, and I was going to avoid going here, but we have to. If you're morally superior to God, where do you get the morality that says it's wrong to kill people? Well, uh, uh, be, because it, I mean, this is going to be subjective because I feel like all of our moral foundations are subjective, but, you know, I've, I've grown up in a society and in an environment where – if we're going to cooperate to grow as a, a group of people, as, as not just like in the United States society, but as uh, the humans, the human society, like the human population goes, if it, I, I believe, uh, and I, I totally accept that this is a, a subjective view on it, but I believe that if we're going to survive as a species, then one of the things that we don't need to do is senselessly kill each other or, or um, per, uh, purposelessly kill each other. Because, I mean, I, it's not that I'm against killing, you know, s- killing somebody if there's 
like a a sufficient reason uh, for that, like uh, uh, defense. Like if you're okay. defending yourself against somebody, sure. you know that kind of thing. Uh, as far as what Numbers thirty one describes, number I, I I would never kill a baby because I don't see any kind of uh, so utility. You never voted pro choice. Oh, I am definitely pro choice, but that's not killing. A but baby. you wouldn't kill a baby. So how does that uh, work? Because you well, vote because for because a, because a, well because a gamete uh, a a uh, fetus. Uh, any other stage of, of, of human development in, in the womb is not a baby. And the point at which uh, a most like 95% abortions happen there, the, 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 um, fe the fetus is not viable. It's not a baby. Uh, it's not a person. Um, it, and so I'm, I'm definitely very pro-choice. Well, I, I was a paramedic for five years and we had a very simple rule. Actually, it was one of the least complicated things to understand heartbeat alive, no heartbeat dead. So I would say anything with a heartbeat's alive, anything without a heartbeat is dead. And if it doesn't have a heartbeat, I was supposed to try to revive it. If it did have a heartbeat, it was alive. And so, uh, definitely. Well, so, so, but, but, a, but a fetus, uh, but a fetus, like at the point at which, uh, uh most abortions happen, like, I, I get that you're trying to talk about the fetal heartbeat bills and everything that says, you know, anything past six weeks, which is when, uh, a fetal I'm just saying before you take the high ground of I've no. never killed babies, you got to consider that you are okay with it in certain circumstances. No, but, but I'm, uh, uh, no, see, because a fetus is not a baby and the heartbeat, the heartbeat that's detected is actually just like a, a, a like a, a rhythmic um, uh, electrical pulse. And the, the heartbeat sound is actually added th by, by the machines that they use to detect it. So it's not an actual heartbeat. Like the, the heartbeat bills are just totally anti-medical science. Like they, they don't consult medical science or anything like that. So, I mean, it's, it's, I am pro-choice and pro being pro-choice is not killing babies. Right. So that's just simply so the, not what uh, that position is. You subscribe is. to the magical vaginal canal theory where once you come out, you're a baby before you weren't. No, that's not, and I don't. Uh, that ma can you repeat that again? The magical, the magical vaginal, vaginal canal theory that says that in the womb you're not a baby, out out of the womb you are a baby. That's the typical pro-choice <laughs> argument. <laughs> well, no, I don't think that that's the typical pro-choice argument. Um, no, they wouldn't uh, describe but, it that way. I would, but yeah, they believe that outside of the womb you're a baby, inside you're not. Magical vaginal canal. Well, no, I mean, I think that it's a point of viability for, well, for, I'll, I'll speak for me. It's a point of viability, uh, uh, thing. So like a, a baby can be viable in the womb way before it's born. Right. Uh, but, but I don't, I don't consider that baby to be born now. Um, as far as the pro choice thing goes, like I said, 95% of the, uh, abortions that do occur occur prior to the point of viability. They, they occur prior to this, uh, fetus being able to survive on its own. It's not developed enough, uh, in order to survive on its own. And so at that point, it, it, it is a, a, a clump of cells. Now, could that clump of cells develop into a human shirt? Sure. If, if the mother chooses to continue the pregnancy, but that doesn't mean that that fetus is a person right then. Now, um, you know, the, the, the later term abortions that, that happen on occasion uh, are like, you know, between 95 to 99% of the time, they are medically necessary abortions that happen. Like there, there's something seriously wrong with the fetus uh, where the fetus uh, or, or fetus and or baby. Uh, well, I guess at that point it would still be a fetus. Um, the, 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 the fetus will not be able to survive outside of the womb and it'll, uh, you know, the, the fetus will die, you know, within minutes of being born, you know, so th there's that thing. There's also, um, th there's also the fact that the more restrictive we are with, um, with healthcare services like abortion, uh, people end up, uh, you know, getting to uh, the, these clinics and places like that where they're, they're forced to have later term abortions. And so if, if we increase the accessibility of uh, um, health services like abortion services, uh, if we make those more accessible, then they're more than likely going to all all elective abortions are going to shift into 
you know, this time period where it's just simply not viable and it's still just a clump of cells that's, that's developing inside of a woman. And so these later term abortions, they're not like something that the mom is like choosing to do the, these are it's either because the uh, uh, the the baby is going to kill the mother or that the um, the the baby is already uh, uh, dead inside of the mother or there's some other kind of reason uh, for it to happen but the important thing is is that they're medically necessary so at no point in the pro choice like argument or the pro choice position is it killing a baby as far as the way that we're trying to compare it to the bible yeah yeah you've got to and i would i would say i'm just going to agree to disagree i think that's a very optimistic view of the statistics of which percentage of abortions are elective and which ones are oh no 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 that's just a straight statistical analysis given by multiple over 60 percent of abortions are elective yeah it doesn't matter if they're elective or not uh, like I, I'm perfectly fine with a hundred percent of them being elective. Okay. All um, right. I thought for a minute you were saying like, we're gearing towards a place where they're only, okay. I got you. No, so no, no, no. You're, I'm you're saying, I'm saying the later, like, well, typically with, with, um, pro pro life advocates, they're saying, Oh, well they're, they're literally, you know, dismembering babies inside of the womb. And it's like, they, they harp on the later term abortions, which are medically necessary abortions, versus the you know uh, abortions that occur prior to like the the 12th week mark uh or tw- it's either 12 12 or 13 uh but um 95 percent of of like all abortions occur prior to the point where you know a lot of major systems are developed in the fetus so it's still just a clump of cells yeah and that that would be one label. I'd have a different one, but I don't want to harp on that. Let's go back to numbers 31 for a minute. So okay. you're morally superior because you wouldn't kill all these people. Babies don't count because they're clumps of cells. So we're going to take a caveat there. No, but- no, no, no. That's not what I said. I said fetuses are clumps of cells. Like fetuses okay. are not fetuses babies. Fetuses are clumps of cells. I call them babies. You call them fetuses. Whatever. The clumps of yeah. cells don't count. You got a caveat for that. We're dealing with women, children, not killing them. If I come to your house and let's say mm-hmm. that you have a barn. And I burn down your barn. The cops are going to come and they're going to arrest me for arson because I should not have burned down your barn. If I go to my house and I'm reconstructing my backyard and I burn down my barn, it is no longer arson because I am reconstructing my house because it was my barn. Oh, if It depends. On, is I your get... barn insured? Okay. Well, hold on. Before we go to the insurance. <laughs> so, if, sorry. If sorry. I just is... I wanted to be a bit pedantic for a minute. You go ahead with your. With no your barns family. are insured in this scenario. Okay. So. Um, in Romans 9, God describes himself as the potter, and he describes humans as the clay. So I would say Romans 31 is 100% just of God because it's his creation. And he's allowed to do with his creation as he pleases because he's the owner of that thing. Now, if I, that's why God can tell me not to murder. And if God takes someone that's not murder because it's his, if I do it, it's because I'm literally taking something that was his and doing with it what he's told me not to do. So I would see it as a position of ownership, not a position of moral superiority. And so I wouldn't say that you're morally superior if you deal with the things that are yours the way you want to, and God deals with the things that are his the way he wants to. That doesn't have any any bearing on the morality argument there because uh, it's uh, okay, his. Okay, okay. Well, well uh, like, so if you have a baby with your wife and you decide to kill that baby, is, is that perfectly fine? Because no. you and your wife made – like if you and your wife decided – we should kill this baby well, and you the kill the Jeremiah baby. Jeremiah says is God that... knit that baby together in my wife's womb. So I would say I didn't make it. God put it there. Now, obviously there's natural processes. God's designed. We know how babies come from not that ignorant of biology and anatomy. We know how the baby got there, but the Bible clearly attributes the creation of that life to God. And since I subscribe to a biblical worldview, I would say, no, I don't get to kill that baby because it's God. He knit us together in our, our mother's womb. Uh, okay. Well, let's, let's say then that you, um, you, um, you know, create a test tube baby. Let, let's, let's say you created, you, you know, you artificially created a human. Does that mean then, then that you can just kill that human whenever you want to? Wow. The year is 3050 and we've actually done something that I don't believe is ever going to be possible. I think that hypothetical. Oh, no, I mean, you could, you could definitely test tube create babies now. I mean, it's not really all that, 
you know, weird. Uh, I, I mean, because you can, you can get, I guess if you go you to can get a sperm, points, you, you can get an route. egg that we even have nano, uh, nanobots that can move a sperm and inject the sperm into an egg. But so, once there I, is life there, God claims to be the author of all life. And so, no, I wouldn't be able to do that. If there's okay, life so, there, so basically, so, so basically your argument is God is just in numbers 31 because God owns all of life. And so therefore he can, I guess he can, he can kill people, but does that give him the right to tell other people to kill other people? Well, I think we're being loose with the word killing. Uh, and like, there's a difference between like a, it's like calling a fallopian tube pregnancy termination and abortion. It's not really an abortion. It's a termination of a life-threatening condition that was never going to survive. So God is not killing people. He's taking them. He's destroying them. Uh, it's only killing when I take someone and I like go after. So I think we have to have different definitions for what happens when I take a life and when God takes a life. I'm never allowed oh, okay, to take a okay. life but except in instances of defense and God prescribed capital punishment. God, God that, that's a bit of a scary thing that maybe we can get into here in a minute. But in Numbers 31. I'm not a serial killer. Don't worry. No, I know. I, I got you. I'm, I'm hoping not, at least. Um, Although so, this could be the blood of the atheist that I've taken down. Who knows? That looks a little watered down for blood, but all right. <laughs> but uh, so in Numbers 31, God is not the one that's killing the babies. No, he's asked his people to do it, and they're following God's command. Right. So would that that would be God God commanded murder. Not if killing, it's not right? murder if God commanded it. Murder it happens killing? when I kill someone, God has not commanded me to kill. Okay. Do, so do you do you believe uh let, let me ask this because this has come up uh recently uh when I've when I've dealt with Mike Winger. Um and that's do you think that it's it's important for uh, as as a as a matter of of the theology of Christianity, if God tells somebody to kill another person now, do you think that you should uh, that that Christian should kill that person regardless of like the 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 legal like ramifications of it? Well, that presupposes that God is going to order us to kill someone now, which I don't believe God does anymore. I believe the canon of Scripture is closed, and he was dealing with his people in a different way. And now we're in a different covenant with God because of what Christ did on the cross. And so because of where we're at in a different covenantal age, no, that's not even a possibility of happening. But if God commands you to do something, you don't disobey God. That would be a higher crime, yeah. And the laws of man, I mean, the Bible's pretty clear, obey God rather than man. So if God tells me to do something now, very quickly, we can get into a group of people that would say, you've got your weirdos that say, God told me to go kill the whole people. And like, obviously, God didn't tell them to do that. It's not compatible with scripture. It's not compatible with what God's doing. Uh, just because someone claims God told them to do something does not mean that God told them to do something either. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, I would say you, you should always follow God and obey him and not not man. So, so you think that a Christian should um, uh, kill another person if God tells them to, but you don't think that that's a possibility now due to the new covenant? Yes. Now, okay. um, obviously, there's a theocracy setting where God prescribes, uh, you know, if, if somebody does certain things, then he prescribed that they would be killed under Israelite law. And so there were times when that is, that is executing justice. That's not killing someone. Killing someone is when I just go up to you and whack you, and I have no reason to do it. It's not self-defense. God didn't tell me to, to go do that. Okay. Well, uh, so, I mean, I, I feel I, I still feel like I'm morally superior to God because, uh, you know, uh, e even if I were a God, uh, I, I think that it would be immoral of me to command other to, – to command my subjects or, or people to kill – like a, a a a baby that's like you know three a three month old baby, which is exactly what Numbers thirty one has. But it, it, I feel like you're saying that it's perfectly fine for Israelites to kill three month old babies because God told them to kill three month old babies. Yeah, if God told them to do it, yeah, that was the right thing to do. And remember, I mean, you're the one who said you admit that there's subjective morality. You are morally superior to God in your subjective culture, in your subjective time, in your subjective morality. 
Well, yeah, but but that's because of what my end goal is. Um, my my because I feel like in order to make this kind of judgment, you have to have some kind of end goal. Uh, my end goal is for the survival of you know like the human species, the survival of my society, survival of people in my life. Uh, you know, with, without um, without negatively affecting you know people around me in in you know serious ways that could harm their lives. Um, so if and, you understood God's end goal, would it make it uh, more palatable for him to be moral in that action? Because it seems well, like the end goal is what justifies what happens. And God's well, yeah, end but, goal was the purification of his people. Well, well, uh, but, but I mean, you don't think that there's like a, a better way that God could have purified, I guess, his people than killing a completely separate like race of people. I mean, if God, who is this ultimate cosmic being with infinite knowledge and infinite wisdom, whose thoughts are higher than mine, decides something the right way, why would I question what that God said? I mean, that would well, be well. Why, okay, okay. So, why would you question what God said? For for one, I think that you would question it because God is asking you to stab a three month year old child. I feel like at that point you should definitely question, is there not like a better way? Like I feel like in, in the case of the Midianites, the problem that God was solving was that the Israelites were mixing with the Midianites and God didn't like it when you mix the races, uh, which uh, and at this point in time, race is just a people group. Like he didn't like people groups mixing. He wanted to keep the Israelites away from this people well, group. The it, idolatry is it not better? The it, groups, what, not the huh? people groups themselves, their idolatry and their evil gods. Well, no, no, no I, I mean, yeah, the, yeah. So the, the worship of other gods, right? Like, r right. Uh, but uh, so, would it not have been better for God just to like tell the Israelites to move to a different place, like move them far enough away where they're not mixing with the Midianites? Like what, what's going on there? And, well, and I uh, think to answer that question, you have to understand how God works with his holiness and the seriousness, which God deals with sin. And so uh, God okay. consistently talks about uh, the, the, the destruction of sin. He tries to add the weight of sin to people. And so it is, it is common all through the old Testament for in Hebrews, we learned there's no forgiveness of sin without the remit, without the, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And that's it's pointing to Christ on the cross and Christ's sacrifice is the only thing that can cleanse us from our sin. So God is consistently showing people how he sees sin and God has been historically consistent. He destroys sin and evil and he exalts righteousness. That's what God has always done. And so as, as this well, horrific not scene is coming in, that brings to us the seriousness of how God dealt with these people worshiping other gods and how, how seriously he took that. Well, so, so sin, sin is transgressing uh, Yahweh, right? Yeah. Okay. If this people group, did not worship Yahweh, then were they committing sins? Oh, yeah. The heavens declare the glory of God. If you ask for light, you find it. Um, to deny God and to reject him is, yeah, that's a sin. That's a problem. Okay. Uh, uh, but, 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 I mean, you, you see that that these people aren't worshiping God, and, and uh, at least Yahweh God, and so that in and of itself is enough to eradicate them. Mm -hmm. How do you, I mean, do you feel the same way now? So I'm not called to go kill all the people that aren't worshiping God, but I am called to go proclaim the gospel to them because I believe that if they don't repent and turn from their sins, they'll be eternally destroyed forever in hell. Yeah, I think God's very consistent about that, which is, do, yeah, which is so, why so I would the, be serious a, about the gospel. So, so there's a there's a William Lane Craig sort of line of argumentation here that it's it's better to kill people that don't worship your God than to allow them to live. Is that how you see it? No, I believe God has to be the one that decides whether they should live or die, not me. Well, yeah, well, obviously, but I mean, he uh, obviously God thinks that if you're not going to worship him then it's better that you die well it's the yeah. same you're either going to die now or you're going to die later so i mean what's really the difference here and the okay the, 
in the age of grace, obviously now we have our whole lives to figure it out, repent and turn to Christ. And if we don't do that, then we go into a Christless eternity and that'd be a problem. But God decided that these people were going to be destroyed for their sin and wickedness against him. And since okay. he made the people in that view, it's consistent. So um, w- would you then agree with William Lane Craig when he says that when the Israelites went into the Midianite city and um, killed like three month old babies, his argumentation is that it's, it's better for the Israelites to kill the babies then than to allow them to live in a uh, society that doesn't worship Yahweh. Is it, well, is, first of all, I that? really don't love William Lane Craig. Um, okay. so I'm not <laughs> yeah. sure that I can go with him on this. And, and for starters, for me, William Lane Craig goes like this. If you don't defend Genesis 1, don't pretend to defend the rest of it. And he doesn't defend young earth creationism, which is clearly taught in Genesis 1. And believe it or not, don't call yourself an apologist to the Bible if you reject parts of the Bible. So I would say he's kind of off the rails anyway. However, um, I would say I can't make that judgment. I would say God had decided for those people to be killed. And so, yes, that is what their future is. And what is good for them or worse for them, that wasn't that wasn't the Israelites' decision. That wasn't their decision. I don't know that it would have been – I mean, dude, humanistically, my perspective, let them live a little longer. That makes sense. But I'm not God. I don't get to make that call. This is like uh, my son when he breaks down his Legos. Would it have better for those Legos to live a little longer on his desk? I don't know, but he made the Legos. He decided to break them down and build something else up. That's the Lego maker's call. And in this situation, this is God's call because it's his creation. These are his pots of clay, and he made that decision, not me. So I would. I like that I'm in the age of grace where people do get to live even when they haven't worshipped God and they have an opportunity to repent. I think that's a – I'm really glad I was born in the New Testament. I'm not going to lie. That, that's a bloody awful scene. I'm, I'm not dismissing the horror of that. I'm saying that from the perspective of a God who owns it all, he gets to do what he wants with it. Uh, okay. Well, I, I mean, I, I guess I just – I think a bit more critically about the actions that are described in the Bible because, like, I think that plunging a knife into the chest of a th- three-month-old baby is a bad thing. Uh, and if if anybody were to command me, God or otherwise, to do that, um, I would have serious questions about doing that. Maybe uh, the Israelites told themselves it was just a bunch of cells. I mean, I mean that's that's not comparable to the pro-choice <laughs> argument. But uh, come on, I, I mean, had to, I, bro. I had to. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, that, but, but ultimately that's where I get back. That that's where I'm coming from as far as being more, uh, uh, um, morally better than Yahweh is that, um, you know, I just, I, I, I don't see the utility in killing small children. I also don't see the utility in forcing, um, virgin girls into sex slavery. Like that seems like an objectively horrible thing to do. Well, and I think this is where I do run into, I mean, this is where I, um, I mean, one of my fundamental arguments, as you know, is I think everyone does believe there's a God else they wouldn't be against it. But I found most atheists generally come down to this. Um, it's, it's not even about whether or not they believe God doesn't or doesn't exist. They believe they'd make a better God than he did. They believe their decisions would be better. Uh, like I think more critical, I would make different decisions. Like you believe you would make a better God than the God of the Bible would. I think that's ultimately well, what it comes think, down to. Well, well, I think in my limited, um, uh, my, my limited ability, like, uh, or my, my limited knowledge. In my limited knowledge, um, as an engineer, I can figure out better ways to separate the Midianites from the from the Israelites. You know. Uh, I, I would, I would figure out, like, I could definitely figure out a better way to but deal with. What if it wasn't situation. about separating them? What if it was about okay. showing God's hatred for sin and His destruction against sin and His desire for purity of His people? Because if that is the end goal, then it accomplished it fantastically. 
It's like Abraham's yeah, I mean, taking I, his I, son I, up on the mountain and, and uh, having the ram was provided at the last minute while he's about to stab his son. The purpose of that was not to uh, traumatize Isaac on youth group camping trips for the rest of his life. The purpose of that was to foreshadow God giving his son for the sins of the people and a ram being provided, a substitute being provided for people. If, the, if, if you don't understand the purpose, then obviously if you have a different purpose in mind and the purpose is to separate them, yeah, there's better ways to separate them. But is there a better way to accomplish the purpose that God had in mind? I would say no. I think God accomplished that purpose the best way possible, graphically showing I, us how destructive sin is. And, and I, I think that um, that uh, I think that that killing small children um, is just not is not going to be. It it is not the way. <laughs> how small? How how small though? Well, now, now now you're we're, you're getting back into the whole uh, pro-choice uh, description there um, of it, which I don't I don't equate you know, know. fetuses to children. So technically, we agreed to disagree there. I know. Right, right, right. Um, but uh, it, it, as as far as all that goes, um, you know, I the the only you you keep saying sin and evil as if the the Midianites were doing sin and evil, but yet the Midianites and and Canaanites and and all these other cultures that God uh, said that the the Israelites should utterly destroy, um, that they really weren't all that different from from the Israelites. Like you, you say that they were doing evil uh, by worshiping these other gods, which I, I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about like child sacrifice and all this other stuff in the Midianite people. Right. Well, so can, can you, yeah, the issue here is idolatry is a sin. And you admitted earlier that I would say the point of me in creation is to praise God. And the issue is not the actual sin that's happened. The issue is who it's done against. If I go out into the forest and I punch a tree, my hand hurts. If I go on the sidewalk and I punch a dude, maybe I go to jail. If I go in the street and I punch a cop, I'm get, I've committed a felony. And the problem is when you commit any level of sin, it's not about what sin, it's about who it was committed against. And so if you've committed a, a tiny sin against this great cosmic being, you are worthy of destruction. And that's the picture the Bible paints for us, that these Canaanites, Why? by not worshiping God, that was a huge sin because he is God and deserves to be worshiped. So well, they, I mean, say, uh, here, here's, here's the thing that I have a problem with here is that why does these finite actions, why, why does an infinite supernatural being care about the finite actions of organisms on this planet, specifically one uh, one organism like I don't I don't understand why God is is so concerned about these minor uh, sometimes minor actions that are apparently sinful against God and are, are so offending that it requires us to be killed like and and we're not talking about like we're talking about minor stuff so like uh, one one i can't remember the exact verse i think uh, i think it's probably in exodus but um uh aaron his two sons who were priests uh they used the wrong fire to light incense and so god spontaneously combusted the both of them why does god care about that like well, if asking, God is this infinitely powerful being and is all knowing and all that other kind of stuff, why does he care about what kind of fire was used to light the incense? We're asking the wrong question though. The, the, the presumption here is that why is God so upset about a little bitty thing? And the actual question to ask is why in the world would God ever save such despicable, deplorable creatures who from their birth reject and rebel against the God of the universe? Why would he ever send his son to die to save these people to eternal life with himself when they've been so horrible? They've rejected him. They've not kept his laws. They've not done what he said. He created something to glorify him. And that creature immediately sins and falls in away from his laws and does the wrong thing. The question is not... Not why would God punish that? The question is, why does God save any of these people and have any mercy at all? No, no, no. The question is still, why does God care which Zippo I use to light some incense sticks? Like, that's still the question. Be like, okay, they essentially use the wrong the Zippo God. lighter, and God's like, I told you to use the pink one, not the silver one. 
And he's like mad about it. So mad that he had Dukin's fireballs up their butts and he causes them to, to spontaneously combust. Like that. I, I get the way that that only works are- though. If you've put God on our scale, if, if you have a tiny version of a little God, we've got a little tyrant who's really mad that we use the wrong Zippo. But if I understand this to be a cosmic being who, without his reality, none of us exist, who created me, who gave me a purpose, gave me a job. And then I did. And I if I alter from the path he has for me in any way at all, I am deserving of eternal torment because of who he is. Remember. I didn't just punch a tree. I didn't just punch a dude. I didn't just punch a cop. We're infinitely higher than that. So it's not like he's a little bitty tyrant who's mad about little things. It's like he's the infinite God of the universe whose creatures, he shouldn't even be tolerating their existence because they're not holy and righteous like he is. Then, I mean, why would he create us in the first place? If, if Great that question. was going to be the situation. Great question. I mean, to glorify himself, to show us how much he could love sinners and declare his great love. Because when we understand how despicable we are, all of a sudden we understand how much God must love us to send his son to die on the cross to give us an opportunity to have an eternity with him when we're so undeserving of it. Yeah, but before he created us, he knew that would happen, right? Oh, yeah. I believe God knew that the greatest way for him. I mean, I don't understand the concept of light if I don't have something that's dark. I believe God gave us and he knew we were going to fall. He knew we were going to sin. And the only way God's love is glorified and magnified is on the backdrop of man's terrible sin. So so let me get uh, let me see if I can get this straight. Okay, so God, knowing that we were going to fall away from him created us specifically to praise him even though he knew that we weren't going to praise him and he did all of this to somehow violently force us to praise him no nope. so the that he of could magnify his and son death. so that he could magnify jesus he did all that up until you said something about violently he did all that he created us he knew we'd fall he knew we'd sin he knew it all be this and he did all that and allowed all that to happen so that he could glorify his son who while we're sinners while we're in our terrible state dies for sinners in a perfect sacrifice to bring them to glory it's all about god magnifying himself so he's an arrogant son bitch Well, it would only be arrogant if he wasn't the cosmic ruler of the universe who created all things and everything else. Oh, no. I mean, he's still arrogant. I mean, he's still arrogant. It doesn't matter if he's like supreme leader of the five nations. In that definition, God is the most prideful being in the world, and he's the only one that's allowed to be prideful. Technically, our concept of pride happens when I exalt myself up against God. Technically, you're right. I I don't know the arrogance the word, but (laughs) the most worthy of all glory— if we had a human act like that, we'd just say they're the most prideful person we've ever met in our lives. So, but because so, God is actually worthy of that glory, it's not pride. It's receiving what is due. Right. So, But, uh, okay, so the way that you describe God as creating beings that he knew would disappoint him in the first place just so that he could, I guess, punish them with eternal torment, it sounds to me like if you were a carpenter or something like that, uh, pun intended with, with the whole Jesus aspect of this. Uh, okay. But let's, uh, you're a carpenter and you get a nail and you know, you're know you like, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to nail this thing. And then you put the nail on top of your hand and then uh, somehow, I guess, you know, God, he's, he's magical. So, I mean, you could get a third arm, but then you, you nail, like you nail your hand to the board and it's like that's perfect, like that. That I knew that would happen, and and it, but but this is how I wanted it to happen: is that I nailed my hand to a board, and I feel like that's the exact thing with God creating humans. It's like, oh, you're not, you're not I know this is, there. I I know that this is not going to work out, but I'm going to do it anyways. Like I mean, I feel like. I, that's that. That's definitely not convincing for me well, as far as like God. At goes. the end of the day, the in the in the biblical argument, you and I both glorify God. 
Either he's going to be glorified in your destruction for eternity because you rebelled against him, or he's going to be glorified in saving your son, and he works grace in your heart to have you repent and turn to Christ. But he, and God takes pleasure in saving people. He never says he takes pleasure in destroying the wicked, but God will be glorified through his creation, whether we like it or not, both ways. But he is most pleased to show us the love of his son on the cross, who willingly went, knowing what he would do, knowing who we are, and then inexplicably shows grace to people who have no deserving of it at all and in an effort to show us his love and who he is. I'm, I'm guessing that you can't understand, like you're, you're not understanding what my problem with all this is, right? Oh, I understand your problem with it. I understand you don't like it. And I know you wouldn't do it this way. And I know you think God has picked a terrible way to reveal his love and that it's just completely wrong of him to do it. I understand you hate it. I'm just saying that is what I see taught in scripture. And I, well, but, yeah, but, but cool do you, that. do you understand that? Like if you, if you were to trans uh, plant God's behavior onto a human person, Okay, but let you me stop. You agree you. that that this would make them every horrible. Every good heresy gets started is when we compare God to us. He's nothing like us. He's his own being. We are made in him images, his image. He's not made in ours. Okay, uh, but still, that that's not answering my question. If 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 we, if if somebody out there acts in the same way that God does, is he not a toxic and and violent ruler? Oh, well, we actually have seen that happen in history. It's called the devil, and he got kicked out of heaven for it, and he's got a pit made for him where he's bound up for the rest of eternity for exalting himself against God. Yeah, if a human acted like God did, it would be completely inappropriate because they're not God, they're humans. It's completely inappropriate for a created being to act like the creator could act. But you understand how this seems to me like just a special pleading fallacy like you know for anybody else this is this is horrendous but because it's god it's perfectly fine to kill babies. but bro you you we do this all the time this is be like me letting my three-year-old drive my suburban it's completely inappropriate and wrong for my three-year-old to drive a suburban it's okay for me because i'm the dad i have the driver's license and i own the suburban and so yeah when you see a, a something doing something they shouldn't do it's inappropriate yeah i don't get to act like god because i'm the three-year-old it's wrong for me to be driving a suburban i'm just going to make a mess of it but it's not wrong for god to do it because it's his rule well yeah but you see you understand that you're not a 3 year old like 3 year olds shouldn't be driving because 3 year olds are not uh mentally capable of doing that but you know you're 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 a grown ass adult like you you can uh thoughtfully think out and, and critically examine the actions of God in the Bible no, and, I'm, and you, I'm you a can see I how they're toxic and, and, and evil. I am a depraved wretch. I am a great sinner. I'm a worm. I do not deserve any of God's grace. I can't think uh, anything without the help of Christ. I'm nothing without the love of Jesus in my life. And I'm, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. It doesn't matter. Yeah, God's given me a brain, but that's only to be used to glorify him. No, I'm not some great being that gets to make all my own decisions and do it. I am a piece of pottery in the pot maker's hand. And the only hope I have for my existence is to somehow glorify him in that and just praise him that I get to spend eternity and with heaven completely undeserving of any love or any grace. If God used me up for miserable suffering my entire life, as long as he was glorified, I'd be cool with that because that's better than anything I would come up with by myself. Okay. I mean, I feel like this might be the fundamental difference between both of us and our worldviews because I get I get that you see yourself that way. I just simply do not have that much of a negative opinion about myself. Now, that doesn't mean that I think that I'm perfect in any sure. kind of sense. In fact, I affirm that I am not perfect, but I'm also not of the mindset that I'm so depraved that I deserve to be killed. Well, I mean, you I feel be, like you can make an email unless, song out unless of that. the Holy Spirit works on your heart. You'll never see yourself that way. That's kind of the human condition. Well, I mean, I, I, th then if the Holy Spirit does exist, I hope that it never has an effect on my heart because I could I I I, I feel I, I feel incredibly sorry for you right now that you feel so negatively about yourself. 
about I, about your existence. About me. Like I, not about what Christ has done to me. I'm incredibly grateful for what he's done for me and taking care of me. And hopefully you're understanding. This is why the question is, why would God save anyone? Like all of a sudden we're like, okay, the Holy Spirit isn't a given. He's not necessarily something everyone's going to receive and get. It's a special thing for God to reveal this to people. And unless he reveals it to you, you'll never see who you are in light of God. And I'm incredibly, I, I have a very high confidence in the grace of God in my life. I believe I've been gifted. I'm good at things. I'm called. But only so much as I use that in his service. Well, yeah, but you, you understand that there are people out there that use God God as a shield and do horrible shit. And they they feel like they're justified in doing that, right? But, but like they're they, they wrong. Ha- huh? But they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do you how do you determine that they're wrong though? Well, if their actions line up with scripture or not. It's like uh, well, Rudolph I mean, but, Valentine, but, 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 the dude that blew up the abortion clinics. Sure. Obviously, you know, I'm not in love with abortion clinics, but that guy that went solo and thought God told him to blow up abortion clinics, that's not uh, that's not compatible with scripture because I live in an age of grace. My job is to go preach the gospel, not go kill infidels or whatever. Do, do you think that it's compatible with scripture to own another person as property? Oh, no, not at all. In fact, that's why in the Old Testament, any laws you see coming, and then even when Jesus deals with it later, Jesus is always fixing power imbalances. Like he says, if a woman divorces a man, which blew everyone's mind, because before that, women weren't allowed to divorce men. So I think I see God is always evening out the power balance between image bearers. Uh, see, I, I I don't see that because there's nowhere in the New Testament that Jesus says, don't own another person as property. Well, in Colossians 3, Paul says, and obviously Paul is inspired by God. I believe God wrote all of scripture through different men, verbal plenary inspiration. Paul says there is no barbarian, there's no Scythian, there's no slave, there's no free. It's just Christ and all in all. In the New Testament, God... Well, no, so so that, that, that particular part of Paul is specifically talking about like it, it, as far as being saved by by Jesus, it's not uh, like that's that's not Paul prescribing that slaves shouldn't exist or that slavery is wrong. That's just saying that you know God, uh, uh, Christ's sacrifice is available to all of those people evenly. I'm like it's not for told one person how I'm or supposed another. to treat people. I'm consistently told how God sees us and it's completely incompatible with the teachings of scripture for me to uh, believe that I could own another human. God is the only one that owns any humans. I don't think I mean there's obviously been weirdos and wackos that try to defend slavery from a biblical perspective but I think if you have a christologically centric hermeneutic you see the freedom of slaves and you see slaves being freed from their sin from their masters and I think the whole purpose of Christianity was to free people not enslave them. Well yeah but I mean like I said before there, there's no specific verse where Jesus says hey don't own another person uh, as property. And in the old Testament, uh, you have verses where they specifically tell you, you know, who you can own as property. So and when mean, they need to be set free and how you need to be treated, uh, which was totally different system than the cultures around them. Well, no, no, no. The, the whole set free thing is about debt slaves, uh, how slaves are to be treated. Yeah. But, uh, that's, uh, that's actually the same as, as most other cultures in the ancient near East, they had laws about how slaves should be treated. In fact, there are certain instances in Israelite in the Israelite law code where it, it's actually a lot harsher uh, in the law code for slaves than than it is in other ancient Near East cultures. So, I mean, in that respect, um, the Israelites aren't really all that unique. Um, but uh, still, it, it doesn't say you know don't don't own chattel slaves. Like don't don't own people as property. It, it never says that God is perfectly fine with that uh, in there. So, well, there is no explicit verse saying that they can't own slaves, like you're saying. I think if you read scripture, it's incompatible with scripture to say that that is possible for us to own slaves, that that would be something God condones. Um, But also he definitely condones it. But you've Uh, got. uh, Sorry, go ahead. But you got to look at uh, Jesus wasn't here for social reform either. Uh, Jesus clearly states his mission is to seek and save the lost. His uh, mission is not to do the social reforms of the day that the Jews wanted from him. Okay. 
So God gives lots of rules about how his people are to treat other people. Um, but specifically, a New Testament Christian, you can't make any kind of argument to own slaves at all from the Bible. And even in the beginning of the Bible, we see God made man as, in his image. Uh, and so we don't have, I don't believe, anywhere are we given... God talks to people about how they deal with their slaves and he talks about how he wants them to deal with them, but God never tells them to own slaves. And he never tells them uh, it, it, he's, he's never saying that it's a good thing for people to own each other. And also our concept of slavery in America is different than other different types of slavery. And you've got words that are translated servant versus slave. And then you've got things like indentured servants and you, you there's many levels of things happening in the culture. It's not all just like, whipping people picking cotton it's not i mean that's a blanket way to put it in the old testament well that's not how i was describing it actually it's leviticus 25 44 through 46 um right it says your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you from them you may buy slaves you may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of the clans born in your country, and they will become your property. You can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life, but you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. So there's a prescription against buying other Israelites, but there's not a prescription from owning people in general. Uh, there's not a prescription that prevents owning people in general. There's a, there's a prescription for buying other people and while it doesn't say you must buy three slaves a month or something like that for the Israelites, it does say, hey, um, you know, this is where you buy your slaves from, uh, your chattel slaves. And I'm a covenant theologian, and that was a specific people at a specific time and a specific, specific right. culture, and that's how God dealt with them. But I believe we're in a different covenant now. Okay, but you understand that the the fringe or crazy people that defended slavery with the Bible was pretty much every single person up until 16, uh, 1865. Well, probably, I, I won't say 1865 because obviously the abolition movement uh, started before 1865. But, you know, whenever the abolition movement kind of started up until that point, everybody justified slavery with the Bible. Well, well, I mean, in, every, everybody in Christian, like in the Christian countries, which would well, be I mean, like, if we rewind back a few hundred years, everybody everywhere justified slavery through all sorts of different means. I mean, that doesn't make it OK. And well, well, yeah, but in the specific ways that we're talking about here, we're we're we're, we're talking about the Bible. Like, I get that the, the, the Bible didn't invent slavery. Slavery was already a thing. It's just that the Bible provided that God you know, com uh, commanded how, who to buy, uh, who should be slaves, uh, where to buy your slaves and, you know, other rules surrounding slavery. People calling themselves Christians took pieces of scripture out of context and used it to justify horrible things. And it's inexcusable. And any follower of Christ, any great preacher, and there were, were great preachers during the time of slavery that were condemning slavery amongst their people uh, or amongst their congregations. I mean, sure. But, yeah, I don't believe that was that's consistent with the biblical theology, but yeah, people did it. I mean, the South African people have it, were justifying white slaves, and Chinese people were justifying slaves, and it's inexcusable, and whatever you use to justify it still makes it inexcusable. And I would take that all the way back to Genesis 1, where God makes man e even in his likeness. But specifically in the New Covenant, I don't believe there's any kind of argument you can make to show that the New Testament... People living under the New Testament age of grace should be owning slaves or in any way owning another human being. Uh, but yeah, okay. there's nuts uh, out there. Yeah. Well, so so uh, maybe maybe we can end on this because I know that we've been we're, we're almost at t we're about twenty minutes away from two hours. But um, I'm wondering if you can explain to me this because like you're saying that oh well these people interpreted in a way that was wrong. And it seems like you have the opinion that you that you have a correct way of interpreting the Bible, right? Uh, I align with Orthodox Christianity. I don't have the corner of the market or the monopoly on interpretation. Oh, no, no. I wasn't meaning like that. I just meant that like you feel like you, how you're interpreting the Bible is the correct way to interpret the Bible, right? Yeah. I hope so. And I continually grow and change as new truth is revealed. But yeah, I'm trying to interpret the Bible correctly. Okay. Well, so like, do, do you feel like 50 years in the future, people could understand the Bible differently than you understand it now? Hmm. Well, 
Uh, they can understand different pieces of it is relevant to them at different times. But Orthodox Christ Christianity hasn't really changed that much. I mean, we have the Reformation in 1517, and you see Martin Luther breaking away from the Catholic Church and reworking things. But even since that time, there's been some pretty consistent essentials of Christianity. And even though people have differed over what we call secondary issues, the main issues have stayed the same. The deity of Christ, Trinitarian position of God, the, these things, the virgin birth, a lot of these things, they've stayed the same for a very long time and those won't change in 50 years well yeah but you you understand that you you said that every everybody prior to you know understanding that that slavery is bad justified the taking of slaves uh biblically like if they were christian they justified it biblically All right, but like so you said that they voices... didn't like that was a wrong understanding of it un until this one certain point and then if you fat like from that one certain point, you fast forward 50 years, people are understanding the Bible completely differently. Now, that's not to say that like the basic uh, theology of Christianity has changed, changed, but like you've definitely got a different understanding of scripture than you had 50 years prior to that. But some so, of the biggest advocates against slavery were Christians who figured out God wasn't cool with this. Um, they changed their opinion. They, they change their interpretation. Of or God says. changed their understanding of what he wanted. Well, that's unnecessarily interjecting God into this situation. God, if, if God interjected and gave them the correct understanding of Scripture, who's to say God didn't interject and give the people who interpreted as affirming slavery, who's to say that that's not God's will there too? Well, I mean, yeah. Now we're now we're playing a pretty subjective chess game here. Um, so, well, I'm just trying to determine like what is slavery what is, is a secondary. Choice? Slavery is a secondary issue. It's not one of the core theological tenets. So, obviously, how we see the Bible interacting with current modern day applications changes over time as the issues change. Um, and I think. People didn't even go to the Bible to look for their answer about slavery uh, nearly as soon as they should have. They just assumed, well, we're all doing it, so we're all doing it. Must be fine for Christians. You know, I think I think people even weren't questioning most of the time. If but. if that were the case, then why did the the Old Testament writers feel compelled to write down uh, the the uh, you know rules concerning slavery? Well, like I said, if it's such you, a secondary issue, what you see in the Bible is. While I would I would like to see an abolishment of slavery in the Old Testament, God didn't do that. And I don't know why God didn't do that. But what I do see him doing is resetting power imbalances, setting in safeguards for the weak and the fatherless. And God is very clear throughout the Old Testament and through the New Testament where his heart is for the afflicted and for the oppressed. 424 yeah, times God calls his people to fix oppression. And I mean, slavery is clearly oppression. So God was doing something well, here with this. Well, yeah, yeah, but you understand that the um, the rules that are laid out in the Bible are not unique uh, or or original to the Israelites. The Israelites copy and pasted rules from surrounding ancient Near East cultures uh, concerning slavery, and they changed a that, few of them. They that's going to be really harsher. hard to prove, though, because no, we, it's not. They, they it's already been proven in the scholarship, huh? Sorry, I was just saying that it, it's already been proven in the scholarship. There's there's scholars out there right now that have shown that you know the ancient Near East had laws that predate the Israelite laws. Concerning well, yeah, slavery. they had laws, but I mean, we could the we same could play, we could play the which scholar says what game all day. Oh no, I'm not trying to play which scholar says what. I'm just saying that we've already established that these laws existed prior to the Israelites co-opting them into their civilization. So I, I mean. They, didn't agree to that or establish that, but that's what you no, no, well, I, I didn't say. I didn't mean for it to come off that. I, I thought that you did. I, I I'm saying that that has been established already. So we already know that the, the, like the laws that you see God commanding in the old Testament are, are not, are not original to the new test, the old Testament. They, they come from the surrounding ancient near East that because they, they were co-opted into the Israelites culture and they just wrote down that God said it. 
But you see the uh, surrounding nations operating in very different ways than the Israelites with a different set of rules. I mean, that's we had the whole discussion about why God had them kill them. Like half the time you see the people sacrificing their babies to Molech and God's like, no, you can't do that. They clearly were not. Well, no, no, let's, let's, let's be clear. God, God was only angry that the kids weren't being sacrificed to him. That's the only reason why he didn't like that. God never action. asked for child sacrifices. I mean, that's consistently. Jepetha? Jepetha. The idiot who made a bad promise? The the idiot who made a promise. That's an idiot. That's not sac- God. But, Everybody but knows he, he still, was an idiot. But no, but, but did God come down and be like, hey, man, I don't want child sacrifices. What are you doing? And in, 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 in the story, the, said that wasn't okay. The guy made a promise that was not compatible with scripture. I believe the guy disobeyed God, dishonored God's law, and disobeyed God's law by doing that. No, no, no. I, th- I feel like you're twisting the story a little bit because what happens is Jephthah says, Oh, dear God, help me defeat your enemies, and I will sacrifice the first thing that runs out of my house when I return home. And so God, knowing what would happen, made the deal with him helped him in battle to defeat God's enemies. And then when he came home, he, Jephthah was expected to make good on the promise. Well, that so it wasn't that Jephthah was like... Fallacy. Because huh? we're attributing Jephthah to the movement of God to defeat those people. Because God could have purposed to defeat those people long before Jephthah made an idiotic promise. Well, no, but but you see, it's not that like the whole idiotic promise thing in Jephthah's mind, he was going to sacrifice some kind of animal that was going to run out to him first because he thought, oh, that that's it. But God, knowing that that was go- that the child was going to come out first, still made the covenant with Jephthah to to help him. God didn't have to help him. God could have been like, you know, bro, this is not going to age well. This is not no. And, and uh, so, I mean, God knew that that was going to happen. He still made the covenant. And so uh, Jephthah had to make good on the covenant. So he had to sacrifice the child, his child. I don't think Jephthah had to make good on that covenant. I believe Jephthah could have said, I've sinned and repented. And he was a patriarchal, prideful idiot who sacrificed his daughter anyway. But because of the clear desires of God not to have people sacrifice to him ever, which is all over the Old Testament, I think Jephthah, Jephthah was wrong and sinned in sacrificing his daughter. I don't believe God required him to sacrifice his daughter. I think Jephthah should have repented for the promise that he made instead of sacrificing his daughter. But, I mean, didn't God sacrifice his own child? Okay, it's voluntary, but yes. Okay, so it kind of seems like some child sacrifices are fine. In, in the, the one Jephthah where, story, the child sacrifice was was voluntary too. But see, it, we've got one God with three whole, persons. Jesus said, whole, "I don't." Jesus said, "I lay my down my life; no one can take it from me." And it's the Father's will. So we're saved by God, from God, because of God, to God. So yeah, God interjected himself. His voluntary sacrifice for our sin is, and it, that's that's not equivocable with child sacrifice because this is God interjecting himself for people on behalf of God because God's the only one that can save us from God. I, I totally agree that God is the only person that can stop himself. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, before we close, I wanted to ask you one more question. And I just want to see if this okay. is fair. So one of the things you said in my previous video was how uh, crappy of me it was to find people where they hurt, minister to people in their hurt, and then try to present them with the gospel. And so you saw that as exploitative. And I was using the word minister to them in their hurt, not exploit. But if I believe the Bible is true, if I believe that there is a God, who will require us to burn in hell for eternity if we do not accept Christ. Is it not consistent and loving of me to try to go convince people by lots of means necessary, not any, but lots of means necessary that they should repent and believe on Christ? Because I feel like it's not a crappy exploitive thing of me. If I truly believe you'll burn in eternity if I don't try to talk to you about Jesus, then it's really just consistent and loving of me to share my worldview and try to convince you to turn to Christ when I'm not going to gain anything from this transaction. Only you have to gain from it. So is that really exploitative or is that just consistent? Well, I mean, I feel like if you're, if you're advising people to find some kind of emotional hurt 
that someone's going through and use that emotional hurt as a way to convince them of your position, which I'm I feel not. like, I okay, well, ma- maybe ma- I, 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 I admit that I, I could got burned somewhere. Ex Christians got hurt by somebody somewhere. And you've got to start there. If you're going to address their worldview, because somewhere, some church pastor, dad, somebody hurt this person badly. And typically in the name of the Bible, which is a big problem. And you have to start at the place of their hurt where the worldview changed before you can have a conversation about worldview. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Well, I, I, I totally admit that I could have been interpreting you in the wrong kind of way or whatnot, but the, the way that I uh, took it was that you were saying, find, find some place where this person has emotional hurt or distress, and then you know you, use that as an entry point to convince somebody of, of Jesus or, or Christianity in general, like you, you use that in some kind of, I'm not exactly sure what kind of way. I mean, obviously I'm not, I'm not out there witnessing to people or anything like that. So I wasn't sure what kind of way, but if you're, if you're trying to uh, explicitly target somebody's pain in order to somehow convince them that uh, God is real, uh, Jesus is his son and Jesus is sacrifice absolves you of this um i i feel like that's you know kind of focusing on on a, a place where this person is weak and exploiting that in order to sort of circumvent any kind of critical thinking that person might like use well the philosophy uh, behind that is treat this person like a person deal with the personable mm-hmm. stuff this isn't just an intellectual debate there is a human behind this and so when i say you need to start at the place of hurt you need to deal with loving that person where they hurt you need to start by treating someone as a person not dealing with their worldview and their perspective it's like trying mm-hmm. to tell someone about the bread of life if they're hungry on the street i believe well how about we feed the people first and then tell them about jesus and that's really more the idea i've got so before i just say I'll pray for you, brother. Like, let's meet some physical needs and actually tangibly show love of God before we talk about a theological love of God, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, Okay. Maybe I can present sort of a a thought, a a thought experiment or, or just a a hypothetical. Uh, Let's say you were, you were trying to witness to an atheist uh, or somebody that's, that's newly become an atheist or or somebody that's an atheist and they, let's say, lost their mother who was who was very religious, and so they're they're deep in their pain about that. Let's let's even say that you know they lost their mother. They were deeply religious, but their mother had some kind of horrible cancer, and right. uh, mother suffered a lot and died, and then that caused this person to stop believing in God. Let's let's suppose that that's a particular situation that's happened. Um, in your whole idea of like let, uh, address that that emotional hurt first, how how would you go about doing that in that particular situation? Well, my my starting mindset would be: there's a good chance this person didn't stop believing in God. There's a good chance they're mad at God. They're confused and they're angry about what happened, and they don't understand why. If God exists, why He would take their mom? So I'm going to start in that part. And then I think a lot of people just have not been taught practical Christianity, where we actually learn how to use Scripture to run to God with our problems and allow Him to. God describes Himself as the Great Counselor and the Great Comforter. And I people, I think most people don't know how to access that side of God. And so I would start by showing them how we can experience God as the great comforter and the great counselor. Yeah. But I mean, do you understand how, how starting from the position that everybody already believes in God, they're just angry at God. Do do you understand how that could come off as like, you know, very, very insulting for the person? Because like, if if I was in the situation where, you know, I was a, I was a deep believer and my my uh, very deeply believing mother had horrible cancer and she suffered until she died. And then I critically thought like about the situation and came to the conclusion that, you know, if there was a God, then he wouldn't have done this to her. Like I, it's it. I don't think that that necessarily means that person is angry at God. That person is just 
critically considering like, well, what does my theology say? My theology says, sure. This. Maybe they're not angry. Well, maybe that's too big of a blanket statement to apply. And yes, I see how that could come across as insulting. However, the issue there is not that they don't believe in God it's that they think they could do a better job. They think if there is a God out there, I'd make a better one. And so yeah, screw that guy. And usually it's a walking away, believing they're a better God, not actually not believing there is a God. And, and so I think you need to at least start there. Sure. It, I mean, there's a great chance that by the time Dawkins died, he really didn't believe there was a God. But I think deep down, the actual issue there is he thought he would make a better God than the God of the Bible. And I think if we're going to deal with reality and issues, most of our issues, people run back to the Bible, show you a horrific scene and tell you how they would have done it better. I think most people just believe they'd make a better God than the God of the Bible. And so that's where I'm starting from. Well, I, I, I do think that, you know, if, if you're if you're taking the Bible literally, I, I do feel like probably most atheists would think that God handled things horribly in the Bible. And in our limited knowledge, we could come up with better ways to handle it. So it kind of makes God seem not all that omniscient or uh, all that good. Uh, and, and, and at least that's how I see it. Like, I, I definitely see it as, well, God did these things. I think that I definitely think that there are better ways to handle this. Um, so uh, I, I don't, I, I see it as making the God of the Bible illogical. Like, I feel like that makes it illogical for, for that God to exist the way that the Bible describes him. Well, I think you're halfway on the right path because you said in my limited knowledge, and I would say God has infinite knowledge, and so his ways are higher than mine, and I trust that. But obviously, yeah, that's but, we disagree. That's why we're having this whole discussion. Yeah, uh, I, like, and I don't understand what infinite knowledge would be, and I don't know how, uh, how, how you would know like how much knowledge you have compared to the, um to the the sum of knowledge in the universe like i, I have no idea oh, how to really God. quantify my that. heart is deceitful and will deceive me my eyes can be tricked my ears can be tricked i can be tricked all sorts of ways i'm completely fallible so i would have no concept of comparing what god's level of understanding truth and knowledge is so yeah okay uh i do have some super chats that came through which i appreciate everybody that that uh, did a super chat today to ask some questions. Uh, would you be okay uh, hanging on for just a little bit to uh, sort of uh, go through some of these super chats? Yeah, let's, uh, I got like another 10 minutes or so. Let's do it. Okay. I'm so sorry. I've kept you on for so much longer than Bro, like. I do. This was a great discussion. Don't apologize. I'm so glad you took the time. Thanks for being willing to do this. Cause um I don't know. I thought maybe you were just a troll. Uh, and so when I threw out the email, I really didn't expect a response. And I'm really, really grateful you took the time to work through it and talk about this. And I'm hoping it benefited the people that watch it as they saw a rational discussion and discourse about two different ideas. So I hope it helps yeah. people. And I'm really glad we were able to do this, man. Oh, yeah, me too. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, we were we were able to have such a, a nice, calm conversation over such a complex topic without, you know, uh, getting, I guess, way too uh, nerdy, I guess, for, for lack of a better word, because like, like you said, at the very beginning of this, sorry, I'm getting all um, I'm getting all of the um, super chats kind of collected now so I can show them on the screen. But sure. as you said earlier, I, um, you know, I, I know the Bible and, and theologies pretty well because, you know, um, when I, when I stopped believing in God, I, I decided that I was, you know, gonna actually understand like why I didn't believe and, and have good answers for people when they asked me. And so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time reading the Bible currently, both my wife and I are, are reading through the Bible on the channel. We've got a Bible study that we do. And I actually um, watched a few episodes. And as you can imagine, as someone who takes it seriously, that was hard to do. But yes, I have watched <laughs> several of those. I'm yeah, they're definitely not geared for people that believe. Uh, Re Reverend is not the word I would use to describe them. No, no. <laughs> uh, OK, let's see. Uh, our first one that we got, I think we're kind of going backwards in time for everybody that's in the comment section. Heather Brown says, I'm not angry, just disappointed that you don't think um, about how most of this isn't possible or real. Are they just pretending? 
I don't want to insult your super chat people. I'm, I love YouTube supporters too, but I have no idea what this means. Okay, let's see. So he- Heather is not angry. She's just disappointed. Um, Who's you? Who's you in this scenario? So you and I, I think. I, I well, I think she's talking to you. Just disappointed that you don't think about how most of this isn't possible or real. I think most of like what we've been discussing as far as God goes. And but I'm the one that thinks just... God is real. You're the one that doesn't think he's real. How does that make sense? I'm the one that does well, think it's real. I think it's possible. <laughs> no, but yeah, well, yeah, but she uh, she seems to be disappointed that you don't understand how it isn't real or isn't possible. Um, well, if I lived it, for the approval of Heather Brown, I'd be really sad right now. Okay. Uh, are <laughs> I'm they sorry, just... I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, are, are they just pretending? Uh, I guess I think that's our atheists just pretending not to believe in God or I not to accept God. I don't think they're pretending, God. but I think there's a subtle okay. difference between not believing and rejecting. And I think the vast majority of atheists have rejected God. It's not that they don't believe in God. And I, that's a nuanced discussion. And I know that you would say you don't believe in God, but maybe that unbelief first has to start with, I mean, look, I'm going to be consistent. Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, which sounds terribly arrogant of me to say. I understand that. That's like, God said that, not me. Okay, so I'm just citing it. But like, yeah, obviously at some point, people can get to a place where they don't believe there is a God. But I think that takes a lot of time. And I think, first of all, it starts off as a rejection of God and his Christianity uh, way before, long before it becomes a, a, an actual belief that, or, or an unbelief in God. Well, I, I I will say that I'm I don't believe in a God, uh, but I specifically don't believe in Yahweh because I reject the definition of Yahweh due to it being an illogical definition or not logically sound in 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 my own understanding like of it like right. it doesn't seem logically sure. sound to me so Fair. so I re- so I think that maybe it's on two different levels because like I don't believe in a God but that goes for all gods. When it comes to specific definitions of God, I'm rejecting the definitions because they're not logically sound. Sure. If that makes sense. That's kind of a complicated way to put it. But (laughs) Uh, Johnny Ripine says Abraham and Isaac. Uh, That's when we were talking about the child sacrifice discussion. Uh, So like God God asked him to sacrifice, you know, the child, but then provided a goat. Was it a goat? Sheep? Ram. Ram. Ram, Ram, that's right. Ram uh, provided the ram to be sacrificed instead of, uh, you know, children. So foreshadowing uh, Christ's sacrifice on the cross for his people. Yes. Well, I definitely think the New Testament uses it that way, but I don't think it was originally meant that way in my, uh, you know, by by the Pentateuch authors. All right. Uh, next up, Heather Brown again uh, saying Joe is describing an abusive relationship. That's when you were describing your rela- like God's relationship to his creatures. Well, there's a huge power imbalance. And between humans horizontally, yeah, that'd be super abusive because there'd be a power imbalance. Between a creator and his creation, that power imbalance is absolutely right, just, and okay. But between two humans, like if I treated – I can't treat my wife the way that God would treat his creation. There's a difference there. It's like your me messing with your barn versus me messing with my own barn. So yeah, I, I understand on a horizontal level, this would be incredibly abusive. Okay. Uh, next up, Eric Storch says an infinite being God is infinite in his insecurity. He has infinite insecurity. <laughs> Uh, Eric again says, could God accomplish a hundred percent of his goals with zero killing or murder? Could his goals have been satisfied without the execution of children? Uh, well, I mean, obviously not. God chose to use those devices to display his glory and accomplish his goals. Um, so could God, I mean, I don't know. You'll have to ask him yourself, but what he chose to do the best way for him to do that in our fallen state, recognizing that sin and death, like even the fact that those things are in the equation as a result of man's sin, not God's original perfect garden, recognizing that we bear some responsibility in sin and death and atrocities. God clearly decided that this was the best way to accomplish his goals, whatever his goals were at those times. So, so no, God couldn't do that. Maybe he could, couldn't, but he chose to do it this way. Okay. 
Uh, who's your buddy says since God had to make a second set of the Ten Commandments because the first set didn't uh, uh, for for with society, doesn't that make God God's morality subjective? He made a second uh, I guess, set because they smashed the tablets the first time. And then Jesus came back along and affirmed the Ten Commandments when he did the Shema with the young Pharisee. So, no, God's well, well, to be, well, I was just going to say, to be fair, I believe it was Moses that smashed the Ten Commandments, but that's because he came down and he found them worshiping a golden calf. Is that right? Oh, let's get even better. Moses smashed the, his copy of the Ten Commandments because he came down the mountain and found them breaking the first one of the Ten Commandments he had just gotten, worshiping other gods okay. besides God. So, yeah. Yeah, Moses smashed and then he had to go get some more. Okay. Just making yeah. sure, because it's been a while since I've read that section of the Bible. Moses, just Moses had a penchant for hitting things when he shouldn't and smashing things. Uh, he, yeah. he had a little temper problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he couldn't get into the, the land of Promised milk and honey, land, Yeah, because right? he's whacking rocks when he's supposed to talk to him. Yeah. Uh, Heather Brown says, Mother death rate in childbirth is rising in America. If I'm risking my life, I have a right to decide with my doctor. Uh, and Heather has had two C-sections. Yeah, if your life is at risk, that's definitely a situation you need to discuss about with your doctor. Yeah. Like a, like a fallopian tube pregnancy. That is, there is no possible outcome ever for mom or baby. There needs to be a termination of that. But I would see a difference between terminations and abortions. But yeah, yeah, no one's saying go risk your life without talking to your doctor. Well, I mean, the it's still technically an abortion because it's a, it's a fetus that has implanted in the fallopian tube, so you're still having to abort the baby. I argue that there should be a different term for medically demanded uh, termination of those things. Like I think abortion, I think we need to define those things better because a fallopian tube pregnancy is different than an in utero third term baby issue. I think those are two different things and we should define them differently. I don't think they belong under the same label. Uh, do, do you think that like if, um, if, if some kind of uh, major medical issue is detected with the baby, like let's say the baby will be born without a skull or something. Do you think that, T terminating that pregnancy at that point is, is, is uh, an okay thing to do to prevent the, you know, uh, when the baby is born to prevent it from suffering before it dies. <sighs> Complicated issue. This case by okay. case. Personally, personally, no, I wouldn't feel like I had the liberty to take that life personally, but that is a case by case issue. You need to look at with your doctor and uh, evaluate yourself with the conscience. And if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit's going to help guide you in the right direction through Scripture. So, okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, Heather again, <laughs> asking. Dude, this as woman, a woman loves you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a, I think she just has a lot of questions for you. Um, Heather says, as a woman, why would I listen to Middle Eastern ancient law, especially if there's no good evidence of said God? Not logical. I mean, I don't think anyone's arguing for her to go follow Middle Eastern ancient law and her definition of good evidence and my definition of good evidence are different. I mean, that's pretty clear. That's the difference between the atheists and the Christians. We have different ideas of what evidence satisfies us and how the logic works. Uh, okay. and, and here's the thing. The Lord has given her the choice not to do that. Like God has given her that option. So your choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, Johnny Rapine says, keep it up for the next two and a half hours of my shift, please. And thank you. Brocephus or KC can tag in if John needs a bathroom break. Hey, what so if Joe needs a bathroom break? <laughs> <laughs> Brocephus is a character I do. It's not like we get a third person living here or something like that. I will say when I first started watching some of your videos and you just looked off to the side and you're like, oh, honey, that's right. I was like, what? And I was like, oh, his wife is like over there. Okay, I got this. I thought you might have had a couple personalities there for a minute. Uh, no, no, it's definitely I, just... I wondered uh, who Honey was. Yes. If I ever do that, Honey is probably a tarantula, not my wife. But. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know my, uh, my wife just yelled up saying that she did a member chat or something, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyways. Uh, I'm, I'm keeping a lookout for it over here. 
But uh, okay, so next next is Johnny Rapine saying, "I think a good approach would be to team up." Uh, would, would be a team up of John and Joe critiquing other apologists' argument and discussing the different fallacies being employed. I think the I, fact that I don't have a loyalty to William Lane Craig and you don't have a loyalty to a lot of people would make that really fun, actually. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> we have we've had we'd have different problems with everyone, but we'd have problems with everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, next is uh, Heather Brown again saying dedicated purpose demonstrates design, not evolved uh, uh, adaptation. I like totally okay. agree with that. I'm wondering why I do. Well, uh, so like evolved adaptation, that would be like, you know, every, every, all of the organisms that we have now are adapted and uh, through, through evolution to survive. And so they're not designed dedicated purpose demonstrates design so like if you've got like like for instance the mount rushmore there's a dedicated purpose of presenting those four heads on the mountain okay so that's what she was uh explaining there let's see more complex is less designed not lo more complex is less designed not less design i think she she may have misspoke there at the end i, th not, I think not she's not helping design. you i think she's not helping you anymore <laughs> Well, this is going back in time, so this is this yeah. is near the beginning of the conversation. Johnny Rapine says accumulation of the results of natural, physical, and chemical uh, and chemical and processes is not proof of design, much less of a god, much less any particular deity. And people disagree on that. Some people believe that is proof of design. Some people believe that's not. That's why we're having this discussion. Okay. Obviously, I think it is proof of design. You don't. Right. Uh, okay. Th thank you so much, uh, for, for, resp uh, for the super chat from Johnny, but also your, your response and staying on. I'm trying to get through these quick so that you can yeah, go. No, you're good. Um, I'm just getting a little jealous of like all these super chats. I'm like, Hey, give me $5. I'm not so terrible. <laughs> I got to buy beard butter guys. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> I got some bills. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, jo Johnny again asks, everyone's an atheist. We just believe in one less God than you. There are over 4,000 religions and over 4, 45,000 denominations of Christianity today. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as to say that everyone's an atheist, uh, but I, I do have an issue with... I think he's like, saying we all don't believe in certain gods. If he's saying well, that... Well, yeah. Well, I mean, the 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 whole the whole idea is is that every no, everybody disbelieves in most of the gods that are out there. It's just that atheists go one god further and just don't believe in any gods. But like, uh, I feel like that's kind of. I, I don't personally. I'm not trying to shit on Johnny or anything like that. But I don't personally use that particular rhetoric uh, just because of the fact that. Like my, my actual problem is how do we make the decision which God to believe in? And right. so that that's why I eventually get to the position of just not believing in any God, because I don't see that there's any good like uh, reason to prefer one God over another God. They all seem as equally likely. And so it's just sort of a crapshoot, which one you should believe in. And, and 45,000 denominations of Christianity. I'm not sure that that's the number I was familiar with, but for the sake of argument, sure. But that doesn't mean they're different religions. That means they're different denominations. And you can have different sectors of people agreeing on certain core ideals, but differing on the secondary ideals, but whatever. Well, yeah, but I think that it's, uh, I think that pertains more or less to like, how how integral is the theology of one denomination to getting into heaven? And I think that while there's like like the, there's so many thousands different uh, thousands of different denominations of Christianity, I think that you could probably sort of bucket them into a few different ideas. You could about you could. Uh, about getting into heaven. Yeah. So and there would be a much smaller number with that. There's going to be a few a, a number of options between those denominations, but much smaller number than forty five thousand. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, uh, and I would say that that's pretty much just about the Pascal's wager argument, but not about like other things necessarily. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Heather Brown says you lose a lifetime of truly living. Uh, and gain an that... eternity of not dying. So I'm cool with it. That's the whole point of Pascal's wager. I've made my <laughs> bets. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I, of course I, I don't know what happens after we die. Uh, so I can't really make a wager on it, but you know, it, as long as you're happy with your decision. That's yeah. And I'm not going to throw out, like, look, I'm not going to throw out my ex- subjective experience as an objective argument there, but I will say that for me, before I had Christ in my life, my life was not worth living. And so it became worth living after God did a work in my heart. And I realized that you're going to, okay, subjective experience, that's your business. But for me, I actually get the lifetime of truly living because of what's happened for me. And according to Pascal's wager, yeah, I would lose that technically. If, if, if I had a desire to live outside of Yahweh's design and sin, um, of course, I believe the Lord's taken a lot of those desires from me. But if I had those desires, I would be losing that by following God. But then in my worldview i'd be gaining an eternity in heaven so it would be kind of a good bet to make for me okay uh johnny uh says i think it's mostly a difference between internal versus external uh, locus of control do you control your life or is it ruled by external forces (laughs) i don't control anything I don't control my life. Good grief. The power could go out right now. I can't do anything about that. No, I don't control my life. <laughs> yeah. I would say that, you know, people can uh, control their reactions to things and they can control sure. sort of like, like you, you can control whether or not you're going to end up in jail, you know, that, that kind of thing. To an extent. Yeah. I mean, sometimes accidents happen, but I want a million dollars. I want a million dollars. That hasn't worked for me yet. So no, I don't control it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I have, uh, I, I did the whole, um, lottery thing, uh, hoping to get a billion dollars. So it didn't, it, that in particular didn't work out for me, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Hasn't worked for me yet either. It's okay. Yeah. Let's we'll say, I think that we had one come in late. Maybe, uh, they were different laws. Answer the question why laws had to change on those tablets. If morals aren't subjective. They didn't change. Ten Commandments stayed the same. So they were the exact same laws put on the new set of tablets as on the old. So at least that's what the Bible uh, says. Not exactly. No, I mean there there definitely were different different laws on the first set than there are on the uh, second set. I can't remember exactly what the first set of laws were because everybody every everybody's been taught the the final set. But the I mean the first set of laws they they were radically different than than the second set that came up. There might have been some overlap, but um, there definitely were different ones. I thought they were the same. But whatever. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, it should be easy to double check because, uh, I mean, it's in the Bible, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, you two I, and a half hours in, who's your buddy? We might look at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cause, cause but smarter are... men than both of us have been debating this stuff for a long time. So we, we there's plenty to talk about here. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I, I do appreciate you stopping by, you know, here, uh, for, for as long as you have, I mean, it, you know, we've, we've done a kind of a marathon of a discussion here. This has gone on a lot longer than you intended, but yeah. I really appreciate you hanging in there and having a good discussion with me. Jay. Hey, thanks boss. Same at you. And I appreciate you. I respect your intelligence. I like the way you're seeing the world. I appreciate being able to talk about it. And honestly, I think our world would be a lot better place if more people knew how to do this. Like, I don't hate you. I'm not mad at you. I'm not going to cancel you. Like, we can discuss ideas and not hate each other and still get along. So I really appreciate that. And I'm glad we're able to do it. Oh, definitely. And I, I'm I'm really glad that you didn't take too much offense or any offense, really, to my response video to you. So, uh, you know, um, I, I'm glad that we were able to hash this out and everything like that. Dude, and my, I, best, my best friend who's a pastor changed my number in his phone to ZZ Comfort because of that video. So I'm all about it. That's probably the best compliment I've ever had is he's just a ZZ Top version of Ray Comfort. So I loved your video, bro. You know. <laughs> ZZ Comfort. I'm like, That's I awesome. can live with that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's your new name, ZZ Comfort. <laughs> That's great. 
Yeah. No, I, I mean, I meant that, like, when I said that, I, I meant it, I guess, how you took it in that it, it was just supposed to be kind of a lighthearted, yeah. like, oh, we're getting into this. Let's, let's have fun. You know, we're, we're here yeah, to have no, fun. Yeah, no, I changed, I changed the intro video on my channel and added that to the montage. So you are now <laughs> eternally embalmed in the intro video of my channel saying, this guy is just a ZZ Top version of Ray Comfort. So yeah. I love that. <laughs> If I could make that my text ringtone, I would. Like, I loved it. So nice. You know, as soon as I saw that video, I told my wife, I was like, I got to talk with this guy. I He's doing a great job. I'd like to engage him more. So awesome. Well, hey, man, I hope that you have an awesome rest of your day. Uh, Thanksgiving, too. Hope you have a great Thanksgiving there. Uh, I don't know if you're planning on doing if if y'all do anything for Thanksgiving, really. I know we're just probably going to eat too much food uh, over About here. But thing. yeah. Anyways, you have an awesome Thanksgiving, awesome Thanks, weekend. The and same. Uh, like do you that. mind if I put this on my channel later? Oh, definitely. Go right Sweet. on ahead, man. I'll be doing that. All right. All well, right, thanks, cool. brother. Have a good Thanksgiving. I'll catch you later. All right. I'll see the same. I'll, I'll, I'll do the same. Everybody have an awesome day. Uh, we will see you heathens on Monday for, for our special Two-Face video. And I guess we will see you heathens later. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens.